It's 6.30. I'd like to call the meeting to order, verify compliance with open meeting law, notification, adopt the agenda. We can all please stand for the Pledge of the Flag. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Uh, number three is staff and student spotlight, AOB student spotlight, the Whitnall High School Enterprise class. Right. And I have some examples of your handiwork. <coughs> there you go. That's great. You can pass these around too. You want to introduce who's, yes, yeah, who's there? We've got the whole crew. Yes, we do. Um, so I just wanted, number one, to thank you for giving us the time to talk about the enterprise class. And we're going to touch on basically the whole STEM wing down there. Since it's new, it's remodeled, and there's a lot of good stuff happening there. So uh, the crew consists of uh, Brian Pangborn, who's the other business teacher and DECA advisor, uh, Jeff Lemmer, who's teaching uh, mostly the metals classes and fabrication. Uh, Matthew Fidua, uh, who is here to represent the enterprise class. Sydney Reinhardt, who I, I know is familiar to you. She's here to talk about DECA and the collaboration that, that we're doing uh, with that. I'm Jim Rummage, uh, business teacher, DECA advisor. And Mark Johannes, who is more the, the woods side of things down there. Um, so just, I mean, to let you know that the STEM thing <coughs> is, is going really well. Uh, a lot of great things are happening down there. Um, the space is working out very well. The, the new remodeled woods and metals uh, areas are going well. Equip, uh, the equipment is coming in. It's been installed, getting better and better at making great use of it all the time. Uh, the new computer lab is being shared. It's been making optimal use of that. The fab lab, that's in constant use. I mean, we're all there. They're always 3D printing something. We've got a few new pieces of equipment that have come in for the fab lab. Uh, a vinyl cutter, uh, we've got a heat press that's coming that we're going to be able to, to do some really good things with. Uh, the new school store business classroom area is working out wonderfully. I mean, it's just fantastic the, the way that's working and uh, giving us an opportunity to integrate both the school store and the classes and it's extremely functional just the way it's laid out. A um, lot of collaboration going on. Uh, the enterprise class, obviously with uh, Jeff and I and, and Mark working together to uh, design products, um, as Mr. Cagle showed you, design them, market them, uh, uh, build them, and then sell them. Uh, and that's con the constantly getting more and more steam and, and more and more energy going uh, to, to where we want to be completely self-funding and self-functional, you know, in the near future. Um, uh, we'd, we hope in the future to have possibly a printing uh, enterprise as well, where we can start printing our own t-shirts instead of constantly out looking for vendors uh, and, and probably paying more than we have to if we can, if we can source that in-house. Could save a lot of uh, activities, a lot of uh, clubs and uh, uh, sports, uh, some money along, along the line as well as giving our kids more skills. Uh, which is what this is all about. If I can uh, interject on yeah, that, it's an absolute nightmare trying to find companies that'll do personalization on the spot. I spend way too much time doing it. So if we could do that in house, that would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And we're on, I think, for DECA, I think we're on our sixth different vendor. Yeah. Just to try to some, find someone who'll service us yep. well at a decent price and do good quality work. Exactly. And, and yeah, it is, it is a nightmare. And, and we, we're hoping by next football season to where we can be to the point where. On a smaller scale, we can uh, design T-shirts, have a few uh, basic designs there at the games, and then personalize a T-shirt while you wait for to personalize a hoodie. Um, and we've got the equipment uh, coming for that. So uh, that's incredible. Yeah, that should be something <coughs> next year. Great. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. Sorry uh, to interrupt. I no, just, no, that's yeah. fantastic. Any any questions? Go ahead and then dive in. Obviously. Uh, we're working on engraving water bottles, making pens and engraving those. I already have a standing order for uh, some for my DECA advisors um, and personalized apparel, as I mentioned. So a lot of good things happening down there uh, and more and more is coming. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'd like to pass.
pass it off to Matthew Fidoa, who's going to talk to you specifically about the enterprise class. Yeah, so um, I was just going to talk about um, what we actually do as a class between both the enterprise and the manufacturing side of it. Um, so what, one of the main things we do is we sell student-made items, and so that's in collaboration with um, the, the wood shop and Mr. Limmer's class. Um, and we, uh, we work together with them to think of products and then create those products and actually bring them into our market and to sell them. Um, and we also, as a class, teach realistic marketing, business, and manufacturing strategies. So we try to focus on, especially for like pricing and those sorts of things, um, how it would actually be like in a real business, in the real business world, how would that um, product be priced. Um, and so some of the, the current uh, enterprise products that we have made, um, one of the, the first things that we had decided to make was cutting boards. And so we worked with the manufacturing class to create those and then actually engrave them with um, the Whitnell Falcons logo and then the Falcon in the middle. And from there we also um, used some of the excess material to create um, the coasters that you can see in front of you. And those just had the, um, the Whitnell W on one side and then the Falcon on the other. Um, another big thing that we've found is really helpful and really productive is the plaques that you can see there too. And um, those, we've got a big interest um, from wrestling with those and um, just players and even for those are the coaches. Um, and the, that seems to be a big hit. Along with bag tags, which we found um, many sports teams have taken a big interest in, which is just um, a tag with the player's name and number and then the sport that they play. Um, and so then what we've accomplished as a class, um, we've been able to expose students to real world strategies and situations, like I mentioned before, with the pricing and how it would actually be priced in a real business scenario. Um, we've successfully designed, produced, and market, marketed, sold products, um, and been able to really reach out to the community and, and sell those. Um, we've created a social media following, and um, the biggest social media following we have is on Instagram, which is around 125 followers. And that's really helpful to actually reach out to the community and let them know how we're um, doing and new products that we have coming up. And we've also created a website to reach out to more customers so it's much more convenient, um, not just specifically with the enterprise class, but also with the school store and integrating that and being able to sell orders online and then fulfill those orders and get them out to the customers. <coughs> and from there, I'd like to introduce Mr. Lemmer. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Skills USA, a new extracurricular activity that um, we're kind of incorporating this year into our uh, curriculum. And even before I start into that, I just want to also highlight like how nice it's been collaborating with Mr. Ramirez, Mr. J, um, and paying board in that area. It's um, just been a really cool experience. Um, but so Skills USA is an extracurricular activity. It's pretty similar to DECA and setup. Um, <coughs> it focuses on increasing students' personal workplace and technical skills. Um, I know we had a oh sorry. I jumped ahead. Um, <laughs> let me back up to how we may get that one, sorry. So before I get into skills, you'll say, how we make our products. So some of the new equipment, if you haven't gotten a chance to go down to the, um, uh, the lab space downstairs. Uh, so we have the Boss Laser HP. That's what we do a lot of our engraving on. If you see the plaques, we do a lot of our engraving with that. Um, we have the 3D print printers. That's the Dremel 3D printers. We use a lot in the Fab Lab. Uh, students. Um, learning CAD and the SOLIDWORKS programs have printed a lot of different projects out of that. Um, the welding booths, we, we got up and running a couple months ago, so students are now learning different welding styles. Um, also, we have the plasma cutter, cutter the oxy-fuel um, cutter that students are working through um, in the metal shop. Um, some newer equipment, uh, we have the vinyl cutter, uh, which Rummage spoke about that our students are slowly going to be able to <coughs> learn and then make new um, items on that, including designs for potentially t-shirts, um, and also the uh, CNC milling machine, um, learning just uh, different G-code and making different products out of that. So that's some of the equipment. If you haven't had a chance to go down there, you should come down and check it out. Um, be happy to show you. And, uh, like I said, the kids are all learning this to make different products for the enterprise <coughs> class as well as just general um, the different courses they're taking down there. So now if we go to Skills USA. <coughs> It might be yeah, after it's Deca. In this class. There, oh, there we go. We changed the order on you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a, a new activity we started this year. 
Um, just want to highlight a couple of trips we've taken so far. So, um, our first one was a District 5 competition. Um, so, within Skills USA, there's over 100 competitions students could compete in. Um, everything from welding, carpentry, um, technical drafting, job interview. Um, it's a broad spectrum of different competitions. So, um, what's really nice <coughs> are these competitions are based off of industry. Um, so, industry makes these competitions. It's easy to kind of incorporate them into your courses. So, for example, the first competition was at Elkhorn High School. Um, we had students competing in welding, um, team engineering, and technical drafting. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, another aspect of Skills USA would be um, getting some uh, personal skills and workplace skills. So, uh, we had the opportunity to tour Kamatsu Mining Corporation um, right off of 43rd and National. Um, so the students got to tour that, learn about the different career opportunities available there, uh, welding, CNC, uh, machining. Um, they also had some software engineers. Um, and they also use the same type of uh, SOLIDWORKS CAD program that we use within uh, WITNOS. So it, it's really nice. And uh, they have some cool summer programs available for students as well. So we're hoping to build a good partnership with them. Um, and they're actually going to be building a brand new headquarters down um, in Walker's Point. Is that the shovel that's right on 43rd National? Yep. So that's the shovel. They're moving, like I said, they're moving <coughs> from that building. They're building a brand new yeah. facility right down by the UW Freshwaters uh, Sciences Building, if you're familiar, down in East Greenfield. Walker, Walker's Point. Yep. Right down there on the waterfront. So it'd um, be a really good partnership, I think, that we'd be able to build with uh, Kamatsu in that regard. So and the next slide is. So our, our latest competition went to Gateway Technical College on a, a similar competition. So we had a couple teams competing in team engineering where they worked together um, to complete some type of engineering task, um, as well as another <coughs> welding and CO2 dragster. We won our first Skills USA medal at that event in the CO2 dragster competition, which is designing a car that has to meet like 50 different specs, and then they race them, and um, a pretty um, cool experience with them. So, uh, and then so we have one more slide. Um, so the teamwork competition, this was at the Nari show. Um, we sent four freshmen to go compete, in, and the task over two days is they get a blueprint, and over the two days, the four of them have to work together with no help from um, their advisor, teacher, and they have to build the structure according to the blueprint. So uh, they did really well. We're going to get the official results at the end of April, um, but they're one of maybe 15 teams in Wisconsin to compete in that. Um, and I know uh, just being there, we've, we've interacted with a lot of parents that were really excited to see um, Wendell represented there. So really good uh, experience there. And I think with that, I'm going to introduce Sydney to talk about Setcha. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, quick question about Skills USA. Is that for kids who are enrolled in your classes, or did you say it was more like an extracurricular that? any Whitnall High School student can join. And I was yep. also curious how many kids are participating in that at this time. Um, so yeah, it's open really to anybody. Um, being the first year, it, we're kind of rolling it out slowly. So it's mm -hmm. open to anybody. Um, and the, I know, like I said, they have uh, everything like birthday, CPR, like there's such a broad <coughs> range of competitions there. Um, right now, we probably had maybe in all the trips I, show, I showed up there, maybe 20 students have participated. Nice. Um, but as more participants kind of see and realize what it's about, you know, they kind of tell their friends and then it slowly kind of grows like that. So mm -hmm. we're kind of trying to lay the groundwork this year and that next year kind of hit the ground running with more students and elected officials and um, more regular meetings to engage them in not only competitions, but also similar to um, DEC, I know I'm going to want to work with Mr. Rummage to do some of the community service um, aspects of it and the volunteering and um, all those different Right, thank you. Yeah. And there's some overlap also with DECA as far as they they have a lot of enter, uh, entrepreneurship events, as does DECA. So we're talking about trying to put some teams together to compete in both. So it's, it's working out really well. Yeah, so I'd just like to take this opportunity now to talk about DECA. I think this year has been one of our best years in history, and I'm really excited to share everything that we've been doing. So we've had a lot of fundraising this year, just ranging from the Penny Wars to Miracle Minutes to the bigger um, events like the Polar Plunge that just happened recently. 
to the our WISN food drive that we won against Greenfield and the Big Bash for Kids that we held in June for Make-A-Wish. And we also held our first leadership lab at Whitnall, and I think that was a very um, knowledgeable experience for all the students that went there. It was open to student council and DECA students, and they learned a lot about how to gain more leadership skills and show their skills in their clubs and activities. And we also had the basketball tournament, and we're going to be having the volleyball tournament coming up next week. So it was a great opportunity for us to raise money and fundraise for other things and incorporate all of the students in the school. And we also had the district-wide food drive that we participated in, and that was very successful as well. We donated a lot of food to a lot of great causes. So I'm really excited about all the service work we've been doing. And this year was our first year ever having state officer candidates. So myself and one other student um, made it to essentially the semifinal round of becoming a state officer for DECA. So that was really cool and a knowledgeable experience for us. And I think it was great to just venture into something that we've never done before. And it was great to see everyone and cooperate with all the other schools in Wisconsin DECA. And then we also had the SEM marketing conference where we had a, couple, or a group of students go and learn more about sports entertainment marketing and just have some hands-on experience with experts and learn from them. And then we also had the district um, competition was canceled this year due to inclement weather. So we weren't um, able to compete in that, which was unfortunate. But next or tomorrow, we actually are leaving for state. So we're really excited about that. And I'm the VP of competition. So I'm really excited. And we've done a lot of prep work. And we're sure that we're going to bring home many medals and be very successful this year. So I'm really excited to go. Um, it'll be Tuesday through Thursday this week. So we'll make sure to update you guys when we come home with all of our new medals in DECA class. <laughs> um, and then we've also really expanded our alumni membership outreach this year. We've already had a luncheon with previous um, graduating members so that they can help us learn more about competition. They've helped judge some of our um, practice dress rehearsals for the state competition. And we've learned a lot from them. And it's really nice to just bring them back in and keep them involved in our chapter. And we've gained a lot of good insight from them. And then we also have expanded our business partnerships We've worked more with the American Family real, Realty executives, and we held a pumpkin fundraiser with them. That was really nice to work with people outside of our um, school. And then we also have a project going to state that works with A&W about just rebranding their image and hopefully increasing their sales that we hope goes well tomorrow. And we also are partnering with Student Council, as I'm the Student Council DEC liaison, so I keep the updated. And we've been working together with promotion for events and just helping each other out whenever we need volunteers and that kind of thing. Cindy, what's a leadership lab? A leadership lab is basically like um, a day-long activity where we had a leadership expert come in, and we do different like activities and just kind of like role play situations that we can work together and also learn different leadership ex skills and know how to use those in our own club activities. Thank you. And then we also have an update on our school store. It's created and managed and operated now by students, which I think is really cool. It's great to have that <coughs> cool enterprise class so we can all work on it together and have it much more student run this year. And it's nationally gold certified, so that's pretty cool that we can be certified by not only DECA, but just you know have that credibility on our hands. And the, pro the proceeds from the school store benefit many students just through scholarships, um, and we offset the conference costs for like state and international for DECA. And we're also continuing to upgrade the store and um, upgrading the product line to make it more conscious of the new health trends and everything. And it benefits not only the student body, but also parents, district, and staff, especially with our new website. They can order it online now. And our social media has really expanded and helped <coughs> that too. Now I'd like to pass it on to Mr. Johannes. Well, hello. So um, I'm first going to talk about the area down there and just thank everybody for having that done. Um, being here for four or five years, in the beginning, I was like a department of one, and you kind of sat down there and you just did what you did. Now we are actually working together, we're talking, and we're always trying to work something new between the enterprise. So we meet a lot more and we 
16 different uh, unions that represented that was here. And what we were able to do was have our classes go there and they um, were able to do some concrete work, some carpentry work, some sheet metal work. There's this great tool out there. It's a actually, it's like a computer for welding. <coughs> So uh, that's kind of what they're starting to incorporate a little bit more because it, it gives them instant feedback on those things. Um, we also had, uh, let me see, we had Muskego and St. Francis and other schools that came in to also go to Lorraine. So it was great for them to see our area. There were a lot of comments about that. Um, what I thought was really awesome is in some of our classes we have of our um, learning disabled and handicapped. And if you, on the screen there, uh, Devin down there is actually working some concrete and, and he just had a blast and he was able to take home a uh, sheet metal toolbox. And so I, you know, there was a lot of positive there. And, and, I, and our kids really did get a lot of introduction into what's going on. We've also been able to have a couple of unions come in and actually show our kids as we start building things. So that's been quite helpful for all of us. Um, as far as the building trades area goes, um, first of all, I do want to uh, go back to the Skills USA and the competition. We did have the all freshmen and we, we do have a lot of people that seem to be really interested in the construction side of it. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is when we went to go get, there were certain tools that Schools USA had us as mandatory. And so when we wrote that <coughs> list up and put the PO through, um, Charlie got that taken care of. But I will tell you, Home Depot was awesome. I told them it was for uh, Skills USA. I told them we were actually going to Competition, and I ended up with about six hundred and fifty dollars worth of things that they just donated to us. So um, they just kept throwing things into. <laughs> it was really bizarre. And then when we uh, when we picked it all up, we actually ended up having uh, they put a note in there to our kids, and they sign you know they signed it. So we are going to make them a plaque. So, I mean, that was extremely helpful because it was some of the stuff that now we put it in a container and it doesn't go to any other thing that we're doing except for next year when we get the skills. So we know that we have everything. In the class, um, we're building a <coughs> half tiny home. <laughs> Not a full tiny home, but it's a half tiny like, home. Like really tiny. So, but the whole goal is teaching them how to do the Subfloor, how to get all the walls, how to build a second level, and then how to make the stairwell that will actually go up to that second level. And what we try to do is on every aspect of it, I do make them go into the computer lab and do research and see if they can come up with something out of the ordinary that maybe we can put into the program. So uh, that's been going really well. We have three tiny homes down there right now. So we have the one that we did first semester, and then we, the, this semester we kind of cut them down a little bit. But they have to put a bathroom in it. They have to do all the electrical. So ultimately, we're getting each phase. We even have siding that they can put up, and they're cutting in windows. So everything is based on not only new construction, but make them cut windows in after we frame it. So because that's a remodel thing. Sure. <coughs> so they're learning how to do that also. So I try to work it both ways. We've also done cinder block. A couple of the things that is going on right now, and I was just talking to Todd, uh, we are building for the school for us tables, benches, and a shed. So, you know, the 
shed was originally going to be like an 8x8 eight eight or an 8x10. Eight well, with us building it, we were actually able to give them an 8x12. So that should grow with them and not where we would have to do something later on. And uh, so we're building the shed. The benches will be eight feet long. They'll be put into the, the, the supports will be in the ground. But they're supposed to be at three different levels. So the first level of the benches around the stage will be for our elementary kids. The second level will be for the middle school. And then the third level will be a little bit higher for the high school. So we're going to try to gear it towards that. And then also in that area, we're putting <coughs> some standing tables that will be put into the ground. They're two feet, about 48 by 28. But so when they have assignments, they're able to ride on them. And we're going to stagger those also so that all of our students have the opportunity to at least use those. Um, for the baseball team, we've built their benches. We've also come back and we're going to be doing a bat rack and a helmet rack. So we're in the process of finishing that up. And then for the old Charlie Wee's, the new cafe, we have actually done the drywall. We are now painting. We've hung all the cabinets <coughs> and just a little extra added on the back wall. We put, we're putting in wainscoting. So um, we're able to incorporate a lot of things. And the kids seem to enjoy it. Our students are kind of taking off with it because now they start challenging Apologize for taking so much of your time, but we're all really excited about what's happening down there and, and good things are happening. So hopefully that's getting out into the community and hopefully everybody understands how thankful we are that we were able to get the referendum passed and, and get this done because it's it's really going well. Yeah, don't apologize. I mean we we love the fact that you're here. I mean this is this show, you know, we sit up here, we make decisions, we getting to hear from students and the teachers <coughs> and how it's actually working. Um, really makes a difference. So thank you for making the time to come. And I will just say one last thing. The coasters, <coughs> even the plaques, we do not waste any material. The coasters are all scrap. Whatever we have left over, and we just keep gluing together and planing it down, even on some of the plaques. So uh, the whole goal is that if we throw or if we're going to cut up any material that can't be used, probably only about a quarter inch thick or less and it probably has some bad ends on it or bad sides so we're trying to use everything and it just keeps the kids understanding scrap is not scrap <coughs> you shared a lot of great stories with us from this area so thank you for coming in and taking the time and it's very exciting to hear about everything that you're doing thank you, thank you. Yeah, great. it's good to be back on the yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those are mine. Those are yours? Yeah. So, yeah, those are mine. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Hello. Hello. Do we have a quarantine tent? Or? Okay. Yeah. I could get closer, but I won't. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> see an x ray, I'll tell you. Hi. Um, so. Uh, Wait, hold on, I have to introduce it. All right, go ahead. <laughs> uh, three so excited. B, staff spotlight, Edgerton Elementary School, Elementary Science, and Micro Credential. Okay, we're going to start off with um, Mrs. Schrader here. Mrs. Schrader is fourth grade teacher at Edgerton. She also coordinates our social studies and our science at the elementary level. And I was supposed to do this back on November 11th, but I was sick that evening. So, uh, so Mrs. Schrader, uh, I had to kind of pull that off the table, and she was um, kind enough to come here tonight. Well, she's coming anyway for a presentation later. But um, 
also to be acknowledged for this. Uh, most of us know about the forward exam. Uh, we're kind of in the middle of forward exam planning right now. Um, but what I received in the fall, as well as Dr. Olson, was a letter from the Department of Public Instruction that said one of your teachers, D, um, had participated in a review, was on a team that participated in the review of the forward exam and the questions and some of the assessment uh, components for science. And I thought, that's kind of a big deal. Um, first of all, it happens over the summer. Um, there's only 10 other, uh, 10 other teachers in the state that are involved with that. Teachers have to apply to be on that team. And uh, they have to have content knowledge, knowledge of uh, their grade level, knowledge of assessment. And so um, in order to have, in order for Dee to be on that team, she would have had to have had that. And then they go quite a bit into uh, the assessment components for, for science. So I think um, from a school perspective and from a district perspective, uh, it's uh, it's great that we have somebody that is in our midst here who has who has participated and knows a little bit more about the inside story of how those that assessment is created. So I thought maybe Mrs. Schrader, if you'd want to just briefly talk a little bit about your experience. Um, I, I, <laughs> hi. <laughs> uh, well, I've done it for two years now, I, and uh, it started well years ago, and Laura Serletti said, hey Dee, I think this would be a really good thing for you to do, and I think you'd be really influential in helping the state uh, design some items for the forward exam. And I'm like, okay, I don't know. She says, but you have to get a resume together. Well, I said I haven't done that for quite a while, so I <laughs> tried to figure out what I did. So I, I got it together and sent it off, and they picked me. Go figure. I was surprised, actually. I was, it was kind of nice. So. Anyways, the, the deal is I go in July for three days, and I sit in this room, kind of like a quarantine. Uh, no, no technology. It actually is really an interesting process with the DRC, right? And uh, sit at a table for eight hours for three days, analyzing about two, it sounds terrible, 200 <laughs> test items, uh, do a lot of reading and a lot of discussion, um, about everything, uh, processing whether the, the design and structure of the items, bias, alignment to standards, um, DOK level. Uh, Which stands for? Depth, depth of, of knowledge. knowledge. Uh, and all of that, and we, I, I analyze all that, and then we have discussions about it. And I think that's one of the most beneficial things for me it's a very diverse group of people. So we have people from uh, rural communities, suburban, urban. Um, they're usually all fourth grade teachers. Um, uh, some representation from special education. Sometimes they're content coordinators or curriculum um, leaders and things like that. So after we go through a, a batch of questions, we sit and discuss all of those factors for each item. It takes quite a bit of time, but uh, listening to other people's perspectives is uh, interesting and just kind of opens my mind. Uh, so I like that collaboration. So anyways, I did that the first year, and I, the first year I was like a newbie, so I didn't really know, uh, you know what I should really look at with all these items. Uh, but I learned through the experience of some of the other people on the staff. Kevin Anderson, who is also part of that team, kind of facilitates that for Wisconsin DPI. He's a science, um, what do you call it, leader. I think he's science for all grade levels, but anyways. Mm -hmm. So that happened, and then the next year they said, Dee, do you want to come again? And I'm like, oh, just what I want to do in July is go to Madison and sit in a room again and go over 200 exam items. And mm -hmm. I did, so I sent my resume in again <laughs> since I had it done the first time. I was like, okay, I could use this again, just update the times. So I did, and I was, uh, I really enjoyed it uh, the second time around, and I felt like, uh, you know, having the experience the uh, first time really uh, helped me do a better job analyzing the test items and, uh, I guess, sharing what I knew with the other teammates uh, that were part of that, that whole uh, item analysis. This year, uh, I'm I think I'm going to take a break from science, though, and I really, because of the new Wisconsin State Social Studies standards, I think I want to apply, send my resume in to do an item analysis for social studies, and um, 
work on that for a bit. I don't know if they'll take me, but I want to try. That's about it. Well, it is Thank not you. a surprise. Good luck. It is not a surprise that you were chosen. You touched a lot of students in, in this district, and you have for quite a long time. Thank you. And I have told you personally, and I will say it here, that you are one of the rock stars in our family. My daughters, my, my wife, they love you. I think we actually saw you in Madison while that was going on. Possibly. <laughs> yeah. But you were on stage. Or after you. Yeah. <laughs> you were on stage. Maybe. That wasn't me. I was, was in, I was in the hotel room you. with it. Just really studying for the next day. <laughs> it, it is, again, it is not a surprise that you were chosen. And we are very proud and we are very fortunate to have you as a teacher in our district. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I agree. And thank you. And I think this sort of stuff is really special. You know, when you get to go and be involved in some of the higher level stuff and some of the behind the scenes work. And I think it really says a lot um, about you as an individual. And it, I think it benefits our schools. There's so many different ways where teachers can make an impact. And so it's just very exciting to hear about. Thank you. Yeah, it's very awesome. Thanks for sharing that experience. Hey, no problem. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. <coughs> before Thank you, you before yeah. you leave, and this will probably come up again with the school forest. Um, would everybody be okay with us moving item seven up till after this so we don't make them sit through the next 45 minutes? I was gonna I'm not for that. Sure. <laughs> Unless you want to stay, by all means, we, you're welcome. We need, to keep, we need to keep the audience somehow. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> exactly. I, I mean, selfishly, we would like that, but it's okay if you want to go. We're fine. All right, so we can move that up um, as soon as you want to finish with the other part. And then sure. We'll call thank back you. Up. All right, thank you. All right. <laughs> Now, if I can have uh, the the rest of the Edgerton staff in the audience, thank you for taking the time for us tonight. So we do have a, a hello. Uh, <laughs> we do have a um, a presentation, a short, a brief um, slide deck for this as well. Um, so this is the team that. I'm really excited for this presentation as well. Um, this is the team that uh, came and asked, I don't know, gosh, about a month ago um, to have a celebration for our micro-credential learning as a staff. And I thought, I thought what a great idea, absolutely. Um, so several of them are um, kind of the, the planning group. Um, and as this uh, spotlight came about, it made me uh, think, wouldn't it be nice uh, since you know at a board level you often hear about these things like micro credentials and you know you know how they're impacted on a um, maybe on a district level but kind of hear the story of a school a school level and how micro credentials are working so um, the team is if you can go to the next one we have uh, myself here uh, Mary Miller so fourth grade teacher hello Mary um, <laughs> Lauren Rolke uh, special education in fourth grade uh, Ashley over here, and she's an occupational therapist. Molly um, is our uh, literacy coach. And then we had um, a kindergarten teacher from a perspective of a, a kindergarten teacher as well, but she was unable to make it. She wasn't feeling well today. So um, Did she work too close to you? <laughs> I may have been working closely with her, or, and five-year-olds. Five-year-olds. Oh, yeah. yeah. it is. Yeah, it's, um, it's kind of the theme at Edgerton. So. Um, so this initial uh, slide just talks a little bit about our micro-credential journey over the past three years, just in terms of um, participation. And when we talk participation, it's those staff who are, were able to take a micro-credential. Um, in year one, I think we celebrated and were excited. Um, and while you, you, you're gonna see a breakdown from January and May for each of these, and that's because there are two submission times for micro-credentials. Uh, we were really excited to have 31% uh, of our staff involved initially and then over half of our staff by the end of the year that were um, involved in at least taking a micro-credential uh, for that first year. Um, that number in year two increased to uh, 62%. And then this past year, this current um, semester, we had 86% of our uh, staff involved in micro-credentials and by the end of this year, in other words, st staff who are going to be working for a submission toward the end of this year, we're going to have 97% uh, of our staff involved in micro-credentials. So, That's we're going to talk a little bit about what we're doing at Edgerton. I think I'm turning it over to you, Ms. Fahrenbach. Okay, um, so 
uh, we got together and said, you know, what kind of made the difference. So we're just here to tell a little bit about our story and um, kind of celebrate some exciting things that we think um, are happening. So when we looked back, uh, we kind of started with um, some uh, really specific planning um, in the winter to spring of that second year. So in um, 1819, in, uh, starting about in January, uh, we started to ask ourselves, uh, you know, how could we get more people are, uh, engaging in this work? And so we had a lot of sources of data. So our um, response to intervention team had collected the staff perceptions survey, that RTI team had taken a leadership survey. We had all kinds of academic data to look at. And um, we started to say, what is this data telling us? And what are some maybe opportunities for growth for <coughs> us professionally as a school? So at that point, we kind of identified um, three areas for opportunities for growth just based on the data that we were looking at. And um, one was around student engagement with literacy and with reading and then access to materials. Um, we also thought about some um, challenges and opportunities for growth in um, deepening levels of comprehension across the board, kindergarten through fifth grade. And then we were really looking closely at culturally <coughs> responsive practices. How could we improve as an, an entire organization at, at Edgerton to, to do that? So after looking at the data, we um, uh, identified kind of those areas for growth and then we started to reach out for um, resources. So several teachers had gone to the Wisconsin State Reading Association Convention. We reached out to some leaders <laughs> at CESA. We networked with other educators to kind of gather um, what was the latest best thinking in those areas and um, what resources could we use for some new learning for us um, professionally. Um, so we cultivated kind of this uh, uh, whole library of mm -hmm. resources and, and, and got some books and then we dug into some online resources. We had companion resources that were available, <laughs> webcasts, podcasts, um, just what could we look at in terms of helping our own professional growth. And then after we gathered those resources, um, we developed some of some actual micro-credentials around what kinds of work could teachers engage in um, to uh, develop some skills in there and then apply them in their classroom. And then um, we developed these uh, micro-credentials and then um, with Mr. D's support, we shared um, those opportunities for growth at a staff meeting. So we spent an entire staff meeting sharing out, um, you know, what could we engage in, what kinds of work we could do so that teachers were able to kind of reflect on their own practice and then set some goals for themselves professionally for that, um, last year's spring's application period for the work this year. Um, so the, the development promotion, promotion made the big difference. The other big piece we think for us is the way we handled our micro-credential collaboration. So and when you engage in work in a micro-credential, you're required to um, meet with a collaborator three times. So rather than doing that individually, we did that um, in <coughs> groups. So different groups that were working on these micro-credentials um, uh, could get together and then learn professionally. So we haven't really had structures in place where kindergarten teachers could work with special educators and with fifth grade teachers and an occupational therapist or speech and language pathologist to kind of grow ideas collectively. So um, some of the stories I can just talk about are when you have a kindergarten teacher talking about how she's struggling with getting kids to engage with nonfiction text and you have a fifth grade teacher talking about those same kinds of things, that shared professional practice is just creates a really great sense of energy, um, professionally speaking. So it might sound silly, but like people would be like, are we having a micro-credential meeting today? <laughs> um, and then people would you know, hang on until the last minute and then the bell would ring and it would be like, oh, we have to stop this great learning together. And um, uh, I just really wanna say that um, it's been a really uh, professionally engaging and rewarding experience, uh, not only for me personally, but for our staff. So um, the way we kind of grow our ideas together is tell a little bit of stories. So um, I think each of these uh, fine young ladies are going to share a little bit about their own micro-credential experience this year. I was supposed to preface this with they're used to talking to little people. <laughs> so this is, this is <clears throat> they might be a little nervous, but <clears throat> just said just go for it. Okay, as stated before, um, I'm Ashley Susan Knife, and I'm an occupational therapist in our district. So as a related service provider, that make up our public schools. Um, so I was really excited about the build your own option. So I was able to build something that lets me grow as an OT and then also intentionally collaborate with the other staff members in our building. Um, and so 
biggest thing that I've taken out or taken <coughs> from doing the build your owns and being able to highlight the things that I want to be working on is it um, as I bring it into the classroom and I'm teaching the student and I'm coaching them through their new learning I realize that I'm also teaching the classroom teacher and the support staff and other students are also benefiting from my new learning so what I had kind of my blinders on for just my caseload is reaching it's a larger ripple effect um, and it's just really engaging in that collaboration and being able to see what other people are doing and see how I can change what I'm doing to support all the students uh, I'm Lauren Rolke, I'm fourth grade special education teacher. Um, so seven years ago, I graduated from Whitewater, and it seems like such like a short time ago, but it's crazy to think just how rapidly um, best teaching practices have changed over the years. Um, and just being out, I'm like, holy cow, there's so many new findings and there's so many new teachings that um, I wanna get my hands on and put within the classroom and implement. Um, so the micro-credential process has allowed me to do that because it's allowed me to explore different opportunities and different um, avenues to go with my teaching. Um, so this allowed me to gain new knowledge, implement new strategies within the classroom, as well as co collaborate with both my grade level team, um, as well as vertically, like Molly had mentioned before, because that's kind of our biggest challenge is being able to talk to kindergarten teachers if you're in fourth grade, because there's not always that um, collaboration time. So it's really nice to talk to everybody within your building. Um, so the micro-credentials this year for me have been a huge game changer. It's kind of a pun for one of the <laughs> micro-credentials that we did this year called Game Changer by Donna Lynn Miller. Um, so this helped me to stay current and um, within this story, within that um, micro-credential allowed me to focus on making books more of interest and more accessible to all learners within the classroom, um, especially focusing in on my current caseloads that I have. Um, one change that I implemented this year um, alongside with my co-teacher Mary was um, bringing more technology within our classroom library for um, certain students to access books that might be um, just like within reach for them so that way that they feel that success with those stories that they want to read with their um, same age peers. Um, another small change that we kind of made but made a really big impact was just bringing my own personal um, library from special education that I've been building upon and bringing it into Mary's library as well because that has been able to access for all of my students along with all the students in the classroom um, in our fourth grade community which has been I think a really cool thing um, and then along with that collaboration we kind of talk about all the different books of interest that a lot of the kids are reading so we're able to kind of focus in on what is it that the kids are wanting to get their hands on and making sure that we have those accessible to all students um, one really, uh, like one small success story that we had this year was with one of our um, struggling students and he really struggled to find those books that he's passionate about reading and wanting to read and get his hands on so we kind of made it our mission to um, focus in on him and so right now he's logged over 100 finished books since the beginning of the school year which is huge because he's been engaged with the reading process and he just feels so successful and it's cool because he's like very proud of his reading and mm -hmm. he always shares it with us like whenever he finishes a book he's like look at what we look, look at what i just finished like i'm up to 110 books now so <laughs> it's really cool <coughs> to see for him um and so that's like one i get um so we found like within that micro credential that accessibility and engagement and are creating positive um, reading experiences that also promote growth within our reading community so we do appreciate <laughs> you guys allowing us the opportunity to take ownership of our professional development. Oh, why did I cry? <laughs> 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 it's just like, emotional one. It also allow, allows us to make a difference in our I teaching. Won't. And also our students. Sorry, I just freaked it. Okay, now it's your turn, Mary. Go ahead, Mary. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> I apologize for my voice. Very raspy, but um, I want to talk. Um, a little bit about, mine says go back in, I wanna explain that. So as a veteran teacher, been here a while, I can say truly with certainty that I've never been part of a staff that's been so collaborative, energized, and really passionate about growing professionally, and then bringing that new knowledge into the classrooms in an effort to do better for all <coughs> students. So this is truly exciting. Molly and I have been here about the same amount of time, and we just like, it's hard to describe, but it's a really special feeling. And I think people, when they enter the building, they pick up on that vibe. And not that it wasn't good before, but there's something special going on right now. And, and we've talked about that, and it's super exciting to us that this is happening. 
Um, I'd like to highlight one quick micro credential story too. And so it's like there's so many good ones. Is, How do we pick? Okay. But um, I'm going to talk about the books that we've read by Kylene Beers and Bob Probst. And um, their book, their kind of their trademark book is Disrupting Thinking. And it's why how we read matters. And so when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so good. And so it's really disrupted my own thinking. And for the better, um, their work is really focused on growing engaged and based on engaging and growing responsible readers, readers who read openly and, in their words, go back in to the text. And that's the close reading we talk about where kids can read something quick and go, yeah, I'm done with it. And they're like, well, tell me about it. They're like, oh, it's about this or that. And they don't really, they're not really engaged. They can't tell you much. And so how do you build that intensity, that passion for reading? Um, we've found so many good um, strategies through reading these books and then reading their sequels that go along with them. And so um, that's been so exciting to have the students go back in again and again and to think and think and then think some more. They're looking for evidence using all these higher level skills like synthesizing and deepening their knowledge, their growing ideas. And so I keep nudging them to go back in. And um, the dialogue has re really risen considerably in the classroom too. And that's again talking about connecting all these different micro credentials and understanding it at a very deep level as a professional so that you can help your students to keep making those gains. And so anyway, um, Every day it's just so exciting to go back into my classroom and to go into the pages of the books with my students and read with them with intensity and passion. And also then to come in to these micro-credential meetings and to really talk deeply and feel like we're really understanding more and doing more for our students each and every day. So um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, because there's a lot of good things happening at our school, and we're excited to share that with you. So thank you. You want to just close it, Molly, on the? Um, sure. So um, as uh, Chris alluded to, um, we have a lot of really great energy happening at Edgerton around this, and we said, let's really celebrate that. So um, somewhere in the mid-January, mid um, we got together as a staff one morning. In the top picture, you can kind of see what's happening in there. Um, the, yeah, the color pieces behind uh, on the whiteboard there are different descriptions of micro-credentials and teachers were able to highlight specific key things that they were learning and put those up on post-it notes for the rest of the staff to see to make it really visual. So there was just some uh, really good energy around discussing about the new learning and all of um, the opportunities that we had to really support kids and help kids grow. Um, and the bottom picture is just a, a larger picture of uh, better perspective. Um, at that same professional learning celebration, uh, we also talked about opportunities for new growth and um, what are some of the things that we might be interested in um, and ways we might support the growing that we've done this year and continue it that forward. And then what are some new areas that we could grow as a staff professionally together? So. Uh, Rachel, who uh, would have told you this is her first year and being fully able to micro-credential, a teacher who's not able to be here. and. Um, she referred to the collaboration that she has with her grade level team as being uh, excellent, but that the micro-credential process has allowed her to expand her collaboration um, well outside her team to, to um, the people on the reading committee, plus the people that are doing the similar micro-credentials that she's doing, and how that's just um, really enhanced her learning and awareness also of what's going on around the building as a whole. So um, there's one <coughs> quote at the end, were you gonna? Is that yours, Mary? <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, found this quote and uh, texted it to Molly. I'm like, it's perfect. And so, uh, schools can't become the best places for students to learn and grow unless we make them the best places for teachers to work and grow. And so, That's just the kind of culture we've got. So, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. okay. So, Ashley, mm -hmm. with Build Your Own, how, did the light go on? This is what I should choose or organically? It just came to you? Um, kind of a couple different things, like a needs-based thing, so seeing what different teachers are doing or what's missing. Like um, a big one was I've done two on social-emotional learning, so really to make zones universal um, at Edgerton. Went into all the classrooms and working on that, and then we did an additional 
one more related to mindfulness. Um, and then another one was, I'm extremely passionate about handwriting and I was seeing gaps in um, the implementation of our handwriting curriculums and just things that the curriculum doesn't address. So probably like my farthest reaching um, thing that came out of that was I've made adaptive paper for students on my caseload so if they need help spacing between their words or making sure that their letters are the right size, that kind of a thing. And I've told the teachers that this is what it's used for and can I put this next to so my student feels like they're grabbing paper from the same and the first grade team took it upon themselves to make that <coughs> available for all students so they just ran copies of all mine and taught the kids how to do it so all students were able to um, access that adaptation. Great. The other question is, <coughs> so I would assume you said this is the first year that the teacher was able to <coughs> fully do it so she was in your fourth year here, right? I three think years that you gotta wait? This, she, she's in her, yes, she was in her fourth year. And mm -hmm. you guys, oh, you think that's the right thing to do is have them well, get their feet wet? We, not wet, but get them on the ground before we start? We don't, yeah, yeah, we've changed, we, we've, since we've started micro-credentialing, we've changed that process a bit. It's uh, after the first full year of being in the district, the second year, it's, um, Teachers will either go into a second round of um, go from pie to what we call cake, which is a district level, district led, or um, or they can be involved in the micro credential process. They can. Uh, they can, you know, that, and that's that's I think at the principal discretion along with the staff member. So are they? They're eager to go. I would say involved. I can only speak for Edgerton and that the majority of the teachers after year one. Uh, have asked to go into the micro-credential process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Stephen? Can you guys uh, just mention oh. the... Oh, go ahead. I, Stephen was oh, going to talk. No, go ahead. no, you're fine. Go ahead. Sorry. Right. Okay. No, I was just saying I really like seeing all the energy and everything in here. This is exactly what I was hoping we would get out of the micro-credential process. Um, with your statistics, you said 97% are enrolled. Is that because one's a new teacher or one is just someone who's not interested? Yet. Can we say? I mean, I, I, I think it's okay to say. It. Um, she said it was okay if it got out. Okay. I, I, she won't be returning next year. Oh, okay. I, I believe that is her intention. Okay. So we fired her because she didn't get. <laughs> oh, jeez. No, no, no. Can, can, you, hey, retire. Chris, can you rewind? <laughs> retire it. 15 <laughs> seconds, <laughs> please. Yeah, no, 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 she said it was okay. Oh, jeez. Okay, I'm gonna turn my microphone off. And, uh, She's a one. She is a wonderful right, teacher. So. We don't. Okay. Wonderful. We do not want her to go. It's, it's gonna be her choice. So. Stephen, anything else? No, I'm good. <laughs> I just set that up. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Move on to John. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to get each, uh, just mention like the name of the micro de micro credential that has had the biggest impact that you've done, and and if necessary, uh, if the name isn't descriptive enough, maybe a, just a real brief description. Of it. Um. I'll start. Uh, there was one, one was about engagement and access to books, and so through that work, I, um, uh, much like Mary, we spent some time thinking about what happens to kids over the summer with the summer slide and, sure. and, and regression. Um, so uh, there were 20 kids on an intervention case loader that, were, that, that I sent books home to over the summer. They could come back over summer and exchange their books out. Um, the statistics that I, or the, the data that I collected on that were 80% of the kids that participated in that um, maintained or grew in um, reading levels just by taking books home and reading them at home. Um, it's interesting to note the kids that did not were not kids that came back over summer um, to swap out books. I don't know anecdotally what that tells us. I'd have to look back a little bit and dig into that data a little bit more. Um, and that uh, out of that, uh, those kids that participated, um, I believe it was 60% were not scooped up for intervention in the fall. And so had they previously been? They had been previously in intervention. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so I was really excited by, sure. by that work. Um, the one that I talked about um, prior was called Game Changer by Donalyn Miller and Colby Sharp. Um, so that one really talked about equal access to books and getting um, books in kids' hands. Um, and how we can provide that. So that one really made me think outside of the box a little bit more, like simple steps that I could easily do to help, um, especially with inclusion within the classroom, making all kids feel successful with um, their choices and making them feel a part of that community. Um, so just by doing, um, putting my library within to Mary's library, um, along with um, looking at different options like um, 
using different technology pieces to help them access different books, and not just for my kiddos, but um, for some of the students within the whole classroom sure. um, together. So that was nice having an impact beyond my caseload. Um, the books I mentioned before by Kylene Beers and Bob Probst are really powerful, but I actually want to piggyback on what they said just to share a connected story. So I read that like in late May, and I was like, thank God I read that first, because one of the micro-credential op options was to kind of think of a project. And um, we had heard Donalyn Miller, one of the authors, speak back in November, I think through CESA, and she had talked about which we all, the summer slide, what happens to kids when they don't read over the summer? And um, what can we do to, and that loss for some of them, um, those who regress, it's cumulative. So they lost three months, then another three months, and also by the end of elementary, this kid is back a year and a half, and um, 18 months. And so she was saying that once we get kids in the classroom, skilled teachers can keep them moving along but it's really hard to close that gap once it's there. And so if you can prevent that gap from happening or stop it from getting worse, that's where it's all at. And so keep them reading over the summer. We do things like book swaps, which is really good, promote a partnership with the uh, public libraries. Again, really good stuff. Um, but we had a big underused resource, our own school library, yeah. right there. And so I had read one of the chapters that's it. So I went to Chris. I'm like, can we please have the kids? Because this uh, research is if kids read three to five books over the summer, they can keep their skill level or possibly even improve over the summer at that upper elementary level. So I said, let's just make it catchy. So for my kids coming to me, third graders, we take, check out four books for fourth grade. Kids going from fourth grade to fifth grade, check out five books to be ready for fifth grade. And um, it's, you know, they can get exactly what they want then. They can check it out. They can have all summer to read what can be longer books. And uh, we'll see what happens. And we got comments where kids were so excited, like, we get to keep this the whole summer. Like, yes, you do. And, <laughs> and if you come to any of the summer reading events and you want to swap it out early, you can return your books, get different ones. And I'll tell you, almost every book came back. And... Um, and I think we should do it again. And, <laughs> and, but but Donlin Miller has a saying. It's her saying, but I'll, I'll say it again because I love it. Better to lose the book than the reader. And so I think um, we're on that path. We need to give kids lots of options and families lots of options to keep them reading and growing when they're not with us. And I think that's just one small piece. But if we keep finding more pieces, there's more ways that kids can go back in and keep reading. We got it in again. Um, so anyway, it, I hope we should do that again. Yeah, it sounds like we're <laughs> going to do it again. <laughs> um, I would say one that we're currently working on, it was just part of the last fall um, application period. It's called Being the Change. And it's based on a book of the same title. Um, and all of us up here are in it. And it's really nice because it's, jump in if I miss something, but um, creating a more culturally sensitive and aware um, child, and so we grow up to be more welcoming and celebrate um, the diversity of, around us. Um, and it's really cool because it's one of the ones that was kind of built with the greater picture of who works at our school. Um, so we have our art teacher, we have our school psych, we have our literacy coach, we have teachers from all grade levels working together and kind of digging apart these otherwise complex issues um, and being able to break it down <coughs> so we can reflect within ourselves and then also figure out how we're going to teach our children to be accepting of diversity and champion them along the way. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Oh, wait. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I think what's a really neat outcome of this is that you can really feel um, the impact that this has had on your school community and your mm -hmm. school culture. You know, where this has started out maybe not not knowing that that was going to happen, but then seeing what's happening at Edgerton is just very exciting. And I can feel that, you know, you're inspired, and it's just, it's really neat. It's inspiring to us. So thank you. Yeah, and I would say lots of success stories at all four buildings. You know, we're telling our story, but I think similarly you could speak to what's happening in the, in the other three buildings as well. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all.
Okay, so we'll do the student council report and then we'll go right in for, from that into the school forest, okay? We just want to make sure there's an audience for the student council report, so. <laughs> Okay, so um, we're going to start talking about Gives Back Week. Um, so Gives Back Week is coming up. Hold on a second while we get the presentation up. And if you can just give your names. Again, you don't have to give your oh titles. Yeah. Just your names. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Emma Peterson. I'm Amelia Katakuton. I'm here as the student council advisor. Okay, so um, Gives Back Week is March 16th through the 20th, so right before um, spring break. So we're focusing on um, giving back to communities located within um, <coughs> Milwaukee, so the homeless population, um, as well as the Milwaukee County Zoo, because a lot of electronics are disposed of improperly um, because they can contain that um, lithium battery they can't just be like thrown in the garbage and stuff so um, we're working with three um, foundations so the McCannon Brown Foundation the Joy House and the Milwaukee County Zoo um, so we've been working closely as a council um, splitting up into committees which has really been effective in the um, success of our club so we um, during our Friday meetings we kind of just uh, give report, um, work together, and then um, split into those committees. So we went around and we got updates from each of them. So the Mr. Falcon um, pageant that was supposed to happen um, on Tuesday, I believe, of next week, um, we did end up having to cancel it due to lack of interest among students. Um, a lot of the boys, we didn't have enough uh, participation, which was unfortunate, but um, we're just going to focus on the other things that we've got going because we also have the pep rally um, committee so they are working hard on coordinating a rewarding uniting and fun pep rally for the staff and students so that's kind of a reward after the fact of the whole gives back week giving back to the community somewhat of an incentive um, and then we're doing a hair donation but <coughs> we did a survey through the students as after prom because a lot of girls don't want to cut their hair before prom which makes sense <laughs> um, so the hair donation committee has talked to um, organization where the hair will be going and they have determined how we will send the hair after the drive is over um, Steven and I will sign up so <laughs> yeah, we can cover before prom we're good <laughs> <laughs> so on the day of the haircut we thought it was really cool the lady who's doing the haircut she said like you bring a friend in so that it's fun and your friend can cut off your ponytail <laughs> and then the hairdresser will like fix it up so that's not all <laughs> janky <laughs> yeah. um so yeah and then we um we have our promotional committee as well so we've been working closely with um them and we've made like slideshows that we put on the school tvs which is really cool and they've been super excited which is awesome. Um, they created a video to show in Falcon Time, which is awesome. And then the collection committee, so those are the people that are actually gonna be collecting the supplies. Um, so they've been working on like <coughs> providing a script to the kids who are going around to classrooms. So we're working with NHS for this. Um, so, they're, so we have like stu two students per second hour that are gonna go into second hours, kind of give a spiel about what's going on, collect the do donations, and remind kids <coughs> what's gonna be happening the next day. Um, and yeah, and all of these supplies are gonna be collected in the counseling office, and then we'll deliver them after the pep rally on March 20th. Um, I just wanted to say, like, I know we're here for student council, but I'm actually our NHS president, and I was so stressed out about having to, like, oh my gosh, I have to get like 40 people to sign up to collect donations. And I was like, oh, I'll give you extra NHS hours. Like, you know, I'll buy you some food. Like, please just come and collect <laughs> donations. And they were like, we don't need the hours. Like, I just want to do this really badly. They were just so excited to collect donations. And I was kind of surprised because I was like, 
17 year old kids have like no motivation to do anything and they were so excited about like giving back to all these foundations and like when I explained to them like what we're doing they just got really hyped about it and they were just like yeah we'll do it for sure so you know it really excites me because I mean I'm sure you know I'm super excited about connecting all these different clubs together and we've been in contact with other clubs like the Leo Club and they're super excited about collaborating with us and just to get all these different um, facets of Whitnall High School to come together for something that's bigger than just our school and our district is something that's really, really exciting for me. Like, I'm literally shaking. I just, it makes me so <laughs> happy great. to see, like, all these people coming together mm -hmm. for something that's so great. Because it's just, like, it's bigger than us. And it feels good to know that we have all these people contributing to it, not just because we're saying you have to, you have to join a committee, you have to collect donations. It's because they really want to and they're mm -hmm. putting their hearts into it. We have people asking, like, oh, are we going to do committee meetings because they want to make sure that they're all put together we, we have these really solid foundations that, you know, you can tell that people are motivated to do things. So it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. It's, um, you, you mentioned the Mr. Falcon, male, par you know, lack of male participation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have three boys at home and Kayla knows where to find all of them. So if you ever need male participation in the future, just reach out to her and she'll gladly corral them. And we shared and we were trying to target um, the junior, senior boys for that primarily. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so we were told to come to the meeting can't have something thrown together at the last minute because that makes sense. They get a little wild and excited about the whole thing because it did go really well the last yeah, time yeah, we yeah. did it. Um, that we kind of need to have a preview of what's coming on stage for us, so it's not just throw it up in front exactly. of us without <laughs> any prediction. Mm -hmm. The other thing is without enough um, students to participate in the pageant part, lack of a better term. Um, we were fearing we weren't gonna have enough student participation to come watch it. Sure. The whole point of the event is to raise money. Yeah. And so without that happening, we were gonna probably end up accidentally spending more money than we were gonna bring in. Sure. Um, so that was the reasoning we had to end up pulling, it, pulling it back from this year, just keeping the idea on the gift back week and the donations we're working on. Um, so that was the reasoning we did. Mm -hmm. We did. No, it's great. Okay, so then another thing that we've been talking about, obviously, is Student Council Poppins. Um, we got in contact with um, the coordinator for Destination Imagination for the team at Whitnall. Um, so we'll have, we have probably like 20 people that are gonna show up there. I also invited the NHS members to pop up. Um, so we'll have a good, hearty crowd for them. So it's really like cheering on, you know, encouraging them to keep going with what they're doing. And then also as spring sports starts, obviously like tennis and golf and baseball, um, as well as softball, we want to be able to show up to those games as well. So. And then also for Gives Back Week, we have our blood drive coming up on March 18th. So um, our last blood drive, we had a couple like technical issues just through the um, center that we worked through um, due to lack of volunteers that they had. So we spoke with the um, organization and we're working to you know, get more volunteers so that we can have everybody donate, which I think we'll have a good turnout this, this semester, which is good, so yeah. We're excited. <laughs> and you're in the musical, right? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. guys did a tremendous job during the art show. Oh, thank you. Are you enjoying it so yes, far? Yes, yes. Oh, that's great. Good, mm -hmm. good. Yeah, you did a tremendous job. Thank you. Good work. Anybody have any questions, comments? All right. Thank, thank you, you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
So we're the team. I have MG Schrader, Jill Matusen, ACE, Amy Grohr. Brian Carroll, Whitman, Bob Evans, Yeah. And this is really kind of nice. because We used to have a, a task force back in the day. We tried to all get together on PD days at lunch. It was really difficult to get everybody's schedule together. So recently, we made this adjustment to have a representative from every school along with the great support from Todd and, and Lynn, too, and uh, it's really working well. So we can find time to meet, coordinate efforts a little bit better, so. Mm -hmm. We meet about once or twice a month. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I might add, I'm a newcomer to the committee, and I have to tell you, I'm very impressed with the passion that this committee has. I've worked with other school boards and task force oh. before, and it's always gone great, but you guys are really motivated, and I'm really impressed, and I'm just trying to keep <laughs> we're happy you're here. Yeah, we're happy you're here. Yeah. I think this structure really helps get things done, too, because mm -hmm. we have time to meet. All right. Hey, so we want to just take a moment to take you into the, the forest a bit yeah. and think about how much time you spend in nature and then think about how beneficial it is to really everyone and why this is so important to all the kids in our district and the people in our community. So sit back. We're going to uh, click that screen. Yeah. You click on the picture. Yeah, yeah, click on the picture in the for link. <coughs> and will the volume be up? Oh. Will we get the ad so we can figure out the volume? You're not connected to the volume. Can we can we connect really quick? Yeah, just the sound. Yeah. Connect to the volume. Can you connect to the volume? The sound. Here, we can just take it. Yeah, I'll just take my computer. Great. Hurry, hurry, hurry up. We got this. We got tech here. We got the tech guy here. Right? It's not like in your classroom. Well, it's really exciting that the workshop people are helping you out. Yeah, we'll too. talk about that. We, they're drawing to this kind of stuff. That's awesome. Oh, Doing a big circle of the whole district. Well, that's why Jay looked back at me about his small, tiny house. Because I was like, why are you going to start building them? So, like, all the pain. Because I was down there talking to him. Yeah, those houses are really cool in there. Yeah. Well, and so if you go there and look, you can tell, like, where the windows, like, I know a little bit about yeah. construction. So you can tell where the windows are. And, like, it's really interesting. And whenever I get a pass now from him, it's just a piece of wood. Like, the kids just bring you a piece of wood that's for their pad. So it's like, were you in which, yeah. So when they <laughs> deconstruct them? At yeah, the they took them apart. Yeah. They will. They yeah. used it all again. Well, because it's about learning how to deconstruct as well. Because I asked you, I'm like, are you going to do it for like a fire? Like, have like a fire at the top? And they actually built it around the ductwork in there. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Hmm. Yeah, the ductwork coming from the ceiling. Yeah. It's interesting down there. It's always fun to walk down there. There's always something going on. Gavin and Roman have both been involved with it, and they love it. Absolutely love it. My name is Phoenix Smith. Um, I'm an ecotherapist based out of Oakland, California. I'm Ariana Kandel, and I am a psychotherapist and ecotherapist. Nature deficit disorder speaks to our lack of basic ecological knowledge. 
It's a term that's used in the ecotherapy community when people have not had enough experience with nature. I think it's actually affecting people's whole nervous systems. We are so cut off from it in daily life. Stay green. Nature deficit disorder is not a psychological term that's rated on a psychological scale. But it's something that you might tell someone they have. Right. You don't know how much I want to pull my phone out of my pocket right now, <laughs> even though I know there was no service, but it's a treatment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. therapy, the way that I practice it is that I connect your health and your wellness to deepening your connection to nature. Being in nature is therapeutic, but ecotherapy tends to be more with some kind of a professional that is supporting another person to actually <coughs> deal with something that's going on for them that's challenging. How often do you get outside? Oh, all the time. I was outside just the other month. In the past 10 years or so, there's been an explosion of research on nature as a health benefit. Ecotherapy, nature, exposure, not something that they teach you in medical school. <laughs> do you have a sense of why that is? They just not used to it. They don't know how, how could it help me. The prescription is get out, you know, get out in nature. Do you know how people generally react when a doctor says, go spend some time in the park? Um, say, I want a pill, but it helps particularly <laughs> with something natural, as opposed to appreciating a painting or a piece of architecture or a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> Depends what kind of sandwich you're eating. <laughs> we tend to be very impatient. We're plugged into our phones through the internet and we get information like that. Nature sure doesn't work like that. It takes time for the body and mind to settle into something, so I would encourage you to find a spot. And when you're at that spot, sit there for a minimum of 20 to 30 minutes. It's 10 minutes even, walking along somewhere beautiful and you can feel different. The way that I do ecotherapy is not just about your own particular issues. That's what people come in with. But what I'm hoping is that I can awaken and raise your consciousness about what's happening it's an easy way to support the well-being and resiliency of all people. I'm just going to hold your hand and I'll bring you around and have you feel different things. When was the last time I picked up a rock? Put your hands out. Wrapping paper. That's good. Um, Listen, so feel it. Sand on a beach. Yeah, it's fun to feel things with different parts of your body. This would be a good exercise for couples. Yeah, in terms gotcha. of trust, because you could lead me right into a, a wall. Sometimes there's a hawk that will come, or you hear a particular bird. Oh, that would be terrifying. When I was younger, and I came out of our side door, and there was a nest of robins directly above the door, and the eggs had just hatched. And so the mother was in a particularly protective mode, and swooped down and started making a noise that I never would think a robin would make, and was flapping its wings like I could feel them on the back of my neck, and I started running, and I ran all the way to the end of the driveway, and it was flapping against the back of my neck the whole way. This has been very enlightening for me. I mean, it was great. I didn't realize how wound up I was. It was kind of a long appointment. by the bench. Get near it so you're at least in the shot. You don't have to interact with the bird. So that's kind of, that's kind of eye-opening, I think. And I, I take the kids to the, the forest often, or four times a year for sure. And, and or outdoor areas, like we go to Grant Park or we just go out to the playground and then we explore and they want to take a walk. You don't have to always be in a forest, but I think kids, they love it. They just, and they don't get the experience of being outdoors as often as like when I was a child. And we have all these am amazing resources around the city and like obviously the forest right here. And I, the kids are deprived to be outdoors or be out in nature. So the 
forest is a, an amazing resource that we have at Whitnall, and uh, I think we're really grateful for that opportunity to keep it going and keep, you know, use it for our learning opportunities. So, yeah. Yeah, we can just use it for that. Okay. Are you okay, Jill? You want to come yeah, sit with us? Yeah, you're here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, you got this. Yeah, so real quick, we realized we needed to kind of streamline our community. So now they have means to do that. They can communicate with us uh, through that email. Uh, in terms of staff, we've always had you know the building <coughs> reps um, available for communication. But I think now that we're all getting the same email, we're not constantly forwarding emails to each other. We know what the needs are of the staff. If they have questions, we can all answer them. And we're you know we're trying to also collect some data in terms of you know, <coughs> not just who's going out there. So what's happening in the forest, um, as if you've been out there, you've noticed that we do have a 16 by 16 stage that was built last year by the tech ed department. Um, so that has been fully done. It can fit a whole elementary class about, I don't know, 20, 30, 30-ish students, 25, 30 <laughs> students on there. Um, so it's a place for them to work at this moment because we don't have any of the benches or tables that they will um, have <coughs> in the future. Um, we have uh, been able to give um, new teachers a tour of the forest just so they know what's there and then with the use of that calendar and once we move on with the shed that will also be a place for um, teachers to reserve or say hey I'm going to use the clipboard what's the passcode so I can get into it or I'm, I'm going to use boots it's muddy out today etc so that way <coughs> all the materials that we have for the forest are out in the forest and available to use. Um, so the high school students um, are utilizing the forest for scavengers hunt, uh, scavenger hunt in Freshman Academy earlier this year. The environmental science class used it for food web activities as well as just kind of perusing and looking for the different invasives that we had. Um, middle school science class was also out there the same day as we were. Um, so life and, and earth, I believe, science are using it. Um, and then the elementary students, uh, D's used it multiple times in um, Edgerton, but what we did is we allocated funds to HCE this year for buses. So we already have funds for them to come for the spring field trips, but it is hard for them to come another day. It's a mile walk, and I don't know if a kindergarten teacher would be able to take her students a mile. So we did allocate for every classroom to have a bus be able to go to the forest in addition to um, the spring field trips. And then in addition, Jared Schultz, um, instrumental teacher for the elementary schools, is looking at doing some concerts in the forest to kind of provide that outdoor experience as well. Uh, we were 
depending on uh, how the weather goes for us. Hopefully we'll have those installed very shortly. I don't know, Todd, did you want to add anything? No, I think you guys all covered it really well. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, um, what we are doing, um, if you've noticed, there's a huge pile of wood chips. And if you didn't notice, we are kind of cutting out some um, elm and oak, correct? And the ash, ash, ash. sorry. And uh, black locust. So we're clearing that out. It is Some of it's invasive. Some <coughs> of it was dead. Um, so we can have a new <coughs> canopy growth. Um, so some of that is actually, we're going to kind of talk where the trees are coming from. So some of it has been allocated from the funds we get. But in addition to this, the city of Greenfield Arbor Day um, tree planting, they've reached out to Whitnall, um, and they do a tree planting in the Greenfield School District. Um, and so they've asked if they could plant a tree here, um, either at the high school or at the middle school that's within the Greenfield um, city proper. Um, and so Todd and Frammy have been looking at a place in which we would add that tree somewhere. So it's a free tree for us, by the way. Yay, right? <laughs> um, so we are going to put it on the school grounds. We're not going to utilize it in the forest just because we know that through construction and stuff we've lost some trees. So um, I believe second graders are going to be coming in for that day. So it's a little ceremony um, in which they will end up all getting to put a little soil on the tree. Um, and it'll be their tree. They can maybe take a picture <laughs> at graduation, right, um, when that tree is nice and big. In addition, Brandon Powers Memorial Tree Planting, um, every year they like to plant little saplings. Um, so we've decided that we not necessarily going to be putting those in the forest, but we know that there's some spots along the highway that could really use a barrier um, from sound. So we'll be hoping like showing where they can plant those over there. Um, in addition, it's also going to add a nice eco corridor for the animals to be able to kind of move along the highway, um, which some in some areas they don't have at this moment. So we're kind of getting a little environmental here, not really school forest, but <coughs> we are working with them. Um, and then the last thing is, is Greenfield, the city of Greenfield is looking to become um, I think they're already a bee city, but a bird city and a butterfly city. Um, so we're going to kind of meetings and learning how can we um, help promote that within the forest or even on the school grounds. So I know you guys are doing a garden at Edgerton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, they're doing a garden at Edgerton. Maybe there's some type of wildflowers we can put in that back prairie area in order to inhibit some more butterfly growth. Um, and then seeing the bee thing is a little touchy because we don't. So we've been working a lot with them, um, and having that email once again is a nice resource because everybody is able to see the communication that's going out. Um, we do have uh, three trail cams out in the forest yeah. currently. Um, I don't think trail cams are the appropriate term because they're all off the trails, yeah. or else we'd have a lot of pictures of uh, the, the walking with dogs. But <laughs> um, with the three cameras, it's really cool to kind of triangulate different uh, animal paths, and just bringing the, the outside into the classroom, not only having these, uh, these cameras out there, not only can our students see that, but the community as a whole can. So, uh, Jill, would you mind clicking on the uh, photo link? And then, and these different, uh, these different pictures that we were able to, able to capture, it's kind of hard to see from right now, but that's okay. Um, really great uh, engaging activities for, for any teacher to use, really. I mean, they're kind of geared more K-6, K-8, but I could see some high school students get into it, especially the kids that walk through the forest every day when they go to school. Um, you know, the forest really comes alive at night, and I think the kids, uh, they don't really realize what that. What is that? It's a coyote. It's a coyote, yeah. So when we're, you know, when the kids are out in the forest, I mean, usually it's like at least 25, Um, you show them there's a coyote out there, they're like, they're like, there's coyotes out there? What's a coyote? You know, is that like a wolf? And then that just starts the conversation. And then, well, there are bears out there? Um, how could we find out? You know, and you pose that question to them, and they do their own little research, and some kids really, uh, really get into it. So I think it's been successful thus far. Looking forward to the spring when, you know, more animals come out to play.
from HPE and Edgerton come together to update the forest lesson plans for the spring field trip. <coughs> last time that we did that was when our educational plan was kind of um, written in 2013. And since that time, some of the, well, Common Core came around and some new updates with social studies and science standards all came around. So we felt it was time to do some updating. So it brought the teams together and on a, a super, super duper cold day and sat in this room right here and worked together to do set up three new lessons, uh, also um, included our teachers and FIED teachers in that planning session. So everything should be updated now and just uh, revised a bit. We tried to get Dr. Olson to come for a hike. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. yeah, we did. We tried to get you. So that making you wake day. up. What was it? No, there, I came in for your cider. Yeah. 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 I had heels yeah. 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 on that. Yeah. 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 I agree. Like, I can't wear heels out. And See, that's what I was saying. I have the same problem all the time. Sinking into the mud or snow. Did I get a day advance in the thing? How about When we have the shut up, you guys can come out and see all the new stuff, right? Absolutely. We'll come back. <coughs> I, I offered another day, but all, you know, you I did. did. I did you say did. I would did. take you. So it's um, yeah. Here are the dates for the spring um, before field trip. And the first time of this year to have K4 coming along. Mm. Previously, K4 has never been included in our um, spring field trip. So um, I'm just very excited to have both school K4 classes coming in. So our youngest learners are going to be out there. Some of our younger learners, I should say, um, are going to be out there for so when you say like fifth grade on May 18th, is that all fifth graders in the district? Yes, so in the morning, um, all the morning time, for, uh, HD comes over <coughs> to the VIP's buses, and you can catch buses coming back yeah. later, you know, pickup time. So morning will be HPE, and then afternoon will be Edgerton. So there'll be a lunch break. The high school um, students are teaching the lessons, yeah. so we have to make sure we give everybody a lunch break there. It's a lot, a lot of kids at one time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. More than a 25 or 30, you were. <laughs> it's yep, it is. Well, we have different stations throughout yeah. the forest. Yeah. Okay. So they don't all go to one location. There'll be four stations and a group of kids like okay. throughout the K-4, mm -hmm. um, though, is both in the morning. Yeah. Which is a big one. So we're very excited about that. And we also want to say thank you to the um, school board for supporting the school forest mm -hmm. and um, continuing to make sure it grows. <coughs> Nature pad. Uh, nature pad, and it was very overgrown the first several years I worked here. I didn't even know it existed, so it's come a long way. So we just want to keep it growing and making sure that we have more community support and also that more of our students are accessing the forest so they can play there. Thank you very much. For your Thank you. This is great. Thank you. So I, I, I do yeah. have a. I'm sorry. Uh, something and so uh, I think what you guys are doing is awesome, but I wonder if you guys have. Uh, if there is a, like a larger plan for an end in sight to the development that you're doing out there, because you know over the years the trails have gotten wider, uh, these some areas have been uh, clear cut for the stage and things like that, and now a shed and these kind of things. And and the more we develop something, the more we take nature out of nature. You know what I'm saying? So uh, we, life's a balance, and I just wonder where that balance lies, or if you have an idea in mind as to where to say, okay, you know, these trails are wide enough, we've got enough facility out there, mm -hmm. at this point we're going to start hitting diminishing returns, and we're just going to have, well, you, you guys know what I'm getting at? Can yeah. I, well, we've been working with uh, an arborist, arborist that was gonna actually ask. over a number of years, um, one of our former yep. uh, alumnus, so <laughs> with no school district, uh, Mike Seeger, mm -hmm. and he's been working, honestly, the entire time, um, talking to us about what trees needed to be eliminated encourage growth and mm -hmm. uh, not block the canopy. Obviously, recently we've had some issues with disease related to emerald ash borer mm -hmm. and then um, Elm's, di Elm's Dutch disease. Elm. So you, those become hazards. Those trees have died. Sure. And um, through windfall and storms that we had even this summer and fall, there was a lot of branches that were in very precarious positions and would have impeded you know, <coughs> movement. So and so that addresses some of that, but yes, we have a, a plan <coughs> laid out for where we're going step by step. The big goal this year, because nothing was really done.
on last year. This year our goal was to try to clear some of the space so that we would have the space to then replant um, more hardy or yeah, and basically more, hardy more or trees. More appropriate trees. Or, yeah. And then also uh, combat some of the invasives. So as part of our plan too, we have, I don't remember the name of the company, uh, hired a company to come and do some spraying and try to get rid of some of the, the buckthorn and some of the other invasive mm -hmm. like weeds. But do you have, in like, I'm sorry, go ahead. In terms of trails, I, the trails are not going to be adjusted outside of, with the new development of the subdivision on the far northwest corner, mm -hmm. uh, the drainage issues there have kind of impacted uh, the, the trail farthest, uh, that mm -hmm. farthest part of the property. It's wet a lot of times. Um, so it's almost impassable because those properties drain onto our property. So there's so a water flow there now yeah. Yeah. where there never was before. So you can. So we're either going to have to rebuild it or retract yeah. the, the trail. So, so the two things about that, uh, before they started building those houses, the tree line actually went further to the west. Mm -hmm. And so I don't really know where the extent of their property is. But right. when they started building, some trees started getting cut back. Yeah. So I don't know where that property line is. That might be worth uh, right. looking into. I would agree. Uh, because things might have migrated beyond actual property line if you know what I mean yeah. uh, but the other thing is so I understand you know involving arborist maybe uh, forestry folks and and you know trying to get the right balance of the plant life out there and that kind of stuff but I still wonder about do you have an end game in mind for how much clearing and building you're going to do because a lot has gone on but at some point it think, you tip a balance I, mean, I, talk. I think we're done building <clears throat> once the shed's out there once we have adequate much done with building unless it's maintaining mm -hmm. um, those structures mm -hmm. um, and then I think we're gonna have to start really developing our the forest so we're gonna start planting so you'll see yeah you'll see trees that are coming down this year we're gonna be planting next year uh, you know you might go another year where we're, we're gonna see trees coming down we're gonna be planting the next year until we have that full foliage forest that we're hoping to maintain that was native to this area um, what is our end game then as an educational standpoint? I would say is maintaining our, our school forest field trip, as well as even starting to make a, a, a library of sorts. Um, so when teachers do wanna bring their students over, they do have resources to utilize. Like I have a lesson I can use that is involving different structures of beaks or evolution. So they can come here and they can kind of just say, oh, here's a library, this is what we're gonna do on this field trip and it matches the unit we're in right now. That's kind of the end game. So we want to make sure that we're going back to a native forest. So there's some things that have to be removed. And it's going to be, you know, we can probably do almost a 10 year plan on it. Like this year we're cutting down, this year we're planting, this year we're cutting down, this year we're planting um, until we get that foliage that we would like that's native. And then like I said, as the educational plan side of it, it's our, our end game is really to have a library of resources for teachers. So when HC wants to come over and they're like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure what to do. I'm Yes, library out. lesson plans that yeah, and, they have somewhere and to go to yeah. and they can at least utilize get the kids outside and utilize it. Okay. But you're you're done building at least and I I don't see us building anymore. I could see maybe just maintaining like that back water line, mm -hmm. building like a boardwalk if that yeah, would yeah. work. Sure. Um that's the first thing I thought of when you mentioned it, like along uh, yeah, Sunny I mean, Slope there, where they had to do some of that along that development. Yeah, that ditch and, and Framie has already talked to us about yeah. that. Yeah, and bit. I think the only other plant. thing would be um, Sunny Slope. Would be sunny Slope's a new I know it is, but it's there, if anybody goes past Sunny Slope, you, you know the thing I'm talking about on the west side. Yeah, oh. it's just a board, like any type of boardwalk. Like um, I went to Carroll, so they have a green. The Green Nature Station has a board. Yeah. It's really mm -hmm. easy to make. Um, just so you're not walking in mud. Right, right. That's really what it's for. So that would be the only Someone's thing, and maybe me. some gravel on some of the um, uh, trails, just where there's, like we have some culvert type things, so we might have to put some gravel there. Mm -hmm. But I would say the actual building, like taking down trees to build is pretty much where Great. after this year would be done. Thanks very much for the information. Yeah, no Appreciate problem. what you guys are doing. Thank you for doing all this, because I know I've got to experience a couple of field trips with my niece and nephew, and it's always a fantastic day. Um, are you planning any volunteer days for invasive species cleanup um, to try and either get the community involved or students? 
I know I'd like to help. I've right. done a few things, but uh, we were talking more. about maybe doing something in April for Earth Day. Um, the Arbor Day thing is something where we would really like everybody to kind of join in. We have, I believe, the Science Club at um, the high school will be buying a tree. Um, so it's being planted at Alcohokee Park over here in Greenfield. Mm -hmm. So it's that's kind of why they wanted to involve Whitnell. That's kind of a park utilized by the residents of Whitnell. <coughs> um, so we're going to hope DECA maybe might do a fundraiser of some sort to help with that. So really getting the community there. And then Earth Day will have some cleanups. And I think in the summertime we might have to do some more invasive cleanups because that's when you see the invasives yeah. is over summertime. So we'll get that information out as, as soon as we can pick a day that we're available to also help. <coughs> The other thing is, is making sure students know how to pull out invasives, yeah. not just <laughs> picking flowers. So that's mm. part of the process too. Thank you. Yeah. I, I meant to ask if you guys had the your email posted out there for, you know, because if you see problems or whatever, you know, you, you want it to be accessible to folks, well, if you could post it right out there. I didn't know if you had it posted out there. It is posted on the school course web page, the right. main page. No, I mean, yeah, I you was know, actually thinking about a that. Physical sign we uh, on the side of on one of those structures or something like that. We can you know? add it to our billboard. We have a billboard <clears throat> uh, that's out in the forest, so we can add it. Because like, mm -hmm. I think it's still um, Gerletti's email. Now that I think that's about right. it, it'll be updated. So we should. We're going out there on Thursday. It'll so be updated. Did you start selling again? Because I didn't click on the link because I already have the shirt and I didn't know there was more stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yes, we can. But if it does open again, do um, let us know. We'll probably do it in April again, okay. and then we'll have something for students. Excellent. Just get your orders out to the people that bought already. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll be honest, when I first started on the board, I was invited to be on the committee for the school forest, and I really don't know what we did, to be honest. So um, you guys have done a tremendous job. I mean, getting it up and running and actually meaningful and doing the work. So thank you. I know it's a lot of time and energy, so thank you all for doing that. That's incredible. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to five discussion and possible future action items. A is review of semi-annual board policy updates from Neola, first reading. And again, what we'll try to do tonight is to collect any potential questions. So this way, if we need to consult with Richard or Legal or whomever it may be, we can work on getting those answers together, get them out before the next meeting, and then potentially uh, include them in the packet if need be. So does anyone will go around? Quinn, do you have any I do questions? Not. Steven? No, and I read them again. Awesome. <laughs> Kevin? Uh, it's not really a policy question, but you can be an election official and not be 18 years old. Yeah, that's a new change. Okay. I read that in there. Yeah. I was like, well, that's different. Yeah. That was my only real question. Yeah. John? Yeah, uh, let me find it. And, and there's a couple more I'm going to have to send you because I left my list at home. But uh, um, uh, uh, email public records, 0167.6. Uh, um, the third paragraph. Uh, I'll let you all pull it or whatever. <coughs> if you guys want to reference it. What number is it? Uh, 167.6. I don't know what page it is in the packet. I pulled it up individually. Cool. But I can find out. Well, that's fine. Out. So that's what fine. part of it? Paragraph 3. Okay. Board members are required to provide to the records custodian all email communications which sent or received, when sent or received on an email address other than the district provided email address using the procedure developed by, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then towards the bottom you say, uh, or the last, very last line is uh, e, uh, each board member as an elected official is independently required by law to comply with public records requests for email communications sent or received on the board member's personal email account which involves district business. Mm -hmm. I think that last four, those last four words there are missing from paragraph three because paragraph three is implying that any email addresses and, and all emails I have I need to provide to the custodian records for the district and, okay. and the intention is uh, should, it should read more like board members are required to provide to the records custodian all email communications okay. and that's where it should be put sure. uh, which involve district business. Sure, we'll review it. Thank you. And then you'll send uh, you'll Well, I've got, I've got okay. two more that I, uh, that yeah. I uh, remembered. I just got to. Well, it's fine. If you just want to send it to us and we can do the research. Well, whatever's easier for you. I would rather uh, mention uh, a couple of them right now. Um, okay. 
Um, if you have if you have one in mind, Karen, go ahead. And yeah, I had sent over a list yeah. of a few things that I was curious about, and just to summarize them um, on the one that John was just referring to, I was thinking that. We probably want to include a simple dis definition of what di district business is that would be helpful in that um, 01.67.6. In 2271, it says that the district will be reimbursed by students. Um, I'm just wondering if that's a question that the board should discuss. Does the board require reimbursement? You know, State statute. Okay. It's required. You're talking about the college thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, had a, I had one on that. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, there's some interesting language that we might want to talk about in 5517 and 1662 that talks about boundary invasions and there's a couple examples that involve boys sports and it's a little bit awkward so I was thinking we might want to take a look at that in those examples um, and then there's a few others 6520 6605 8310 and 8800 so I've emailed some things um, but we could, I think that what we should do is maybe take those out for some further discussion by the board. If we're, when we have this big batch, then saying, okay, maybe these few would need some discussion from the board um, or, or just separate it out, so. Okay, we'll take that under reference. Great, suggestion. thank you. So on the college one, um, my thing on that was, uh, and I think it's in more than one place in that when it's like a two-page deal, but um, uh, it talks about, for the reimbursement portion, it talks about uh, may be required, this is the last paragraph in the green there, may be required by the board to reimburse the board the amount paid on a student's behalf. I think the intention there is to reimburse the district, right? And I think we have, a, is there not a separate board account for, for some expenses that the that the board incurs, like buying water and things like that. So that reference there is how legal does anything to the board that represents the district. So we can check about why it says so when it says reimburses the board, the if you go back to the original bylaws, it talks about the definition between the board and the district. The board is synonymous in this case. It doesn't literally mean the seven people here. So I would I understand they're not going to be repaying sure. us, but I think that the language should be more consistent. So under tuition payments for technical college attendance, it says the district shall pay the technical college the cost of students' tuition for attendance. And then it goes on. And, and I don't see any reason for the uh, text on reimbursement, the, the language to not say uh, may be required by the board to reimburse the district. If you can put that in writing, and I'll just check. I, right now, I couldn't tell you if that's a, there's a reason, but I, I, I get the parallelism. I, I think yeah. there should be consistent language. Mm -hmm. um, and then on, um, uh, oh, I wondered why uh, the leaves of absence uh, stuff that uh, has been, or the proposal is to change it from uh, from things being like, Voluntary uh, discretionary voluntary leave of absence. So 3430 is one example. I think there's like three or four policies in these kinds of things that, that list this. But uh, uh, discretionary voluntary leave of absence uh, from the board now says to this will say if approved to the superintendent. Uh, any any reason we're changing it from uh, board authority to superintendent authority? Thirty-four thirty is an example of a policy that includes that language. Change. Yeah, we can make a note of it. We can do the research and get back with the other answers too. Okay, so we may need. Um, I wonder if I mean, is there unless there's some some need to approve this stuff at the next meeting, uh, or a vote on this stuff at the next meeting? I wonder if maybe the next meeting can can be about discussing these items after the research is done. So it's not like, well, here's your answers, let's vote. You see what I mean? Well, okay, so if we can get the questions this week, we can work on getting answers out before the next meeting so you'll have time to review it. Um, so this way you can have an answer. We can discuss them in the meeting, but you'll be able to view the answers sure. before the meeting. But so the you're not the, getting it during the meeting. Okay, so, but the, my problem with that is that that means most of the work on this is done behind the scenes and not, not in public. That's why I just said that we can share the answers in public and we can include them in the board packet if need be. So it's not done behind the scenes, but you're asking for more leadway and in, in, in information before the meeting, right? 
So we're offering to give you that ahead of time so you can prepare for the meeting. We can share it with the public. It's not keeping it from the public. It's giving you time to review it. I understand it's giving me time to review it. I, I don't know that it gives sufficient time for discussion <coughs> at the meeting. Uh, with uh, Even if the stuff is provided tomorrow, I don't know that it gives us time to discuss it at the meeting where I think the work should, uh, should take place in front of the public. Well, we, it, but some of this stuff has to be done behind the scenes yeah. as far as uh, referencing the Iola to find out sure. what, what it is. Yes. That can't be done in front of us. I understand that. But we do this quite, I mean, with other topics where we have discussion before we vote. So we can do that at the yeah. end. Yeah, 150 pages of policy, though, is, is uh, my, my general, I guess, repeating issue with this is, uh, Quinn, when you ran the, uh, uh, well, you run the policy committee, but when, when you ran the review of these policies in chunks, there was a fair bit of discussion about each policy and proposal change and that kind of stuff. And I just think in this, uh, and I express this every time, and I'm sorry if I'm not changing my, my view on this, but I just feel like this is such a large chunk of policies with so many proposed changes, I think is watering down the attention that we used to pay uh, to to our policy changes. Okay. And so, you know, I don't know, I just I just still think it feels fast tracked with 150 pages of policy and even if we get the answers tomorrow, it'd be like, you know, discussion vote. And sure. I'll I'd, take it. I'd like to slow it down. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, and that aligns with what I was saying, that <coughs> in some things, perhaps we pull them out and talk about them a little bit. Understood. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to B, course enrollments with Charlie and Bob. So I'm going to, as they're coming up here, um, I'm going to just share a little bit. Uh, if you remember last year, um, it was sort of discovered that Consistently, the board hadn't been seeing or approving the low enrollment course per, per board policy, which has been a board policy, and I think we said we need to fix that. We need to get into a system in which the reports we bring to the board at this time are consistent from year to year, so the board has some expectations. They see um, some longitudinal data. We get into a process, and so talking both with Bob and Charlie, we had not really had established timelines um, at that time for middle school and high school. Um, as far as making sure that we were doing that. So this whole process that we're looking at um, really is, is, is about getting students registered and from that registration taking a look at course enrollments, deciding what that means for teaching assignments, deciding staffing, putting it into a schedule. And, that, and that's a, it's, a, it's a long process and most high schools are starting that in January if not December. We did not start that till very late the last couple years and it put us behind in a lot of those things, specifically with the staffing piece of it because there's some timelines that state statutes dictate to us. We don't have control over that. It's in the state statute. So part of that is making sure then that we have schedules for teachers so they know what they're teaching next year before we leave at the end of the school year. We know kids, we've resolved course conflicts before they leave before the school year. And any fluctuations that we have um, with courses over the summer due to new families coming in or whatever that happens are the things that we're working on rather than building a schedule and trying to figure that all out. So we really stepped back and made a priority that our whole course registration timeline at middle school and high school um, was done in a timely manner so that we were getting that information early enough to make the decisions that we need to. So this year, what you see in the packet is sort of setting the expectation moving forward <coughs> that always the first meeting in March will be where the board sees preliminary information as that relates. Um, usually by the end of March, we, we have some timeline, um, but, but as we start to look at preliminary non-renewals as it may or may not relate to course enrollments, that's, the timeline is critical to that. So this is what you're going to expect every March as far as meetings. You're going to get preliminary information and then at the end of March you're going to get some final information. When we talk about um, this information and what the board needs to approve, because remember the action on this proposal that the board eventually takes is due to the policy that says the board has to approve any classes that are under 18 and for specialized classes in areas under 15 and that's the, the most critical part that the board's role is in that because that's where you say approval. 
and that had not been happening consistently in a timely manner. So that's really what tonight is about. But we're providing you sort of the background of information, the timeline, how it all fits together, because it is sort of hard that you jump in on that end decision without really knowing the whole process that goes into that. So you're going to sort of see that. That's why um, I asked both um, Bob and Charlie to put into the packets their timelines, some of that other information, so you had some background into what does happen in the scheduling process, all that behind the scenes stuff, what considerations are made so we aren't saying, have you thought about, have you thought about, because there are some things that are in place. The thing that we, that we did not establish very well was a timeline to do things in a timely manner, and that's really what this is about. So you are, you are seeing some things that will become the norm moving forward when the board gets information about course enrollments. Um, and it will be in the beginning of March, so that sort of sets that forward. The format you see in the board packet tonight worked with Bob and Charlie to say this works for both schools because um, courses are different lengths at the middle school than high school for some of that, but we had to sort of come up with a formula that whatever you're looking at, you understand how we're counting students and how sections and all of that stuff um, come, come forward. So what you see is that format. I'll let them each speak to um, any of the things that you will see or read across um, as we look in that format. I did want to as we look at that, and we had some great presentations tonight by great teachers and stuff that you don't all get to see that often. We were very fortunate to be able to be amongst that and, and work, work at that level all the time. But Kathy, can you put up one of the things that I do want to remind the board before we get into the sections and where things fall is that the pathways that were created about three years ago around those three areas that were a K-12, if you look at that document, if you remember that, we saw that not too long ago. So when we look at those health sciences, the IT computer science, and those manufacturing pathways, those were very intentional. If you think about that, we supported staffing, we supported facilities around those areas, and we supported courses because we said those were high demand, high interest areas that we need to build some, some course sequence, some scope and sequence as we look at 512. So when um, Chris and Lori and Lynn were here talking about fifth grade electives, we also showed you this document. So we're continuing to show you that we're building this. I think you'll look at some of the course enrollments and say that where students and parents are choosing their courses are also aligned in this and what that means. You saw the, you know, under our enterprise presentation, we doubled, we added a, a second high school tech ed teacher and a second business teacher this year because of course enrollments and you saw some of the excitement that's happening there because of collaboration. So. I wanted to just put all of that out front before we start looking at data and what is more exciting at 8.30 <laughs> on a Monday night than looking at data. Yeah. So, I don't know guys if you flipped a coin if we're trying to do uh, younger kids <coughs> before older kids or I'll what you decided. But <laughs> I didn't say the principals, I oh. said students. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we can just follow the board packet, I guess. Um, so high school, so in here you'll see, as Lisa kind of described, the high school scheduling process. Um, in a nutshell, really, it is we get our course guide out to families um, by January, so there's a lot of work prior to that, and so uh, working with counselors and department chairs to get the course descriptions updated and whatnot, uh, get that out to students. This year you saw uh, some posts around our expo night, so that was to get our incoming ninth graders to know more about our courses and course options. Um, as well as our current students helping them get a better frame around what, what we offer. And then uh, through February, students are picking their actual classes. And their process that they pick classes, uh, they fill their schedule with their primary requests and their alternate requests. So the primary requests, those are the classes they want to fill in first. Uh, we know certain core classes, their English and math, those are classes that are kind of mostly picked for them. Um, there are some options there, but very few. Uh, but really it's the electives that they pick from. Uh, we have them pick alternates because we know that <clears throat> depending on what their schedule hap has, uh, they may not be able to take another course. Uh, so the, the second sheet is some of, the, some of those assumptions and considerations that we take while we're scheduling things. <laughs> we know that there are certain classes that have to happen at a certain time. So whether it's a single AP class or a class with a shared staff member from the middle school, those classes kind of take precedent in where we fit them into the schedule. As such, if a student, say, wants choir, and choir is shared with middle school, uh, that blocks out that period of time so that they may not be able to fit into another class. We obviously do our best to try to balance out those singletons so that we don't have the conflicts, but if we do, 
then we move on to those alternate requests for the students uh, and continue working through through that process. Um, additionally, you know, we look at certain classes like our, our reading intervention and math support classes and we know that those section numbers are probably going to increase um, as we continue to work with students through this second semester. Um, and if we identify students too early, we may place them in the wrong classes. Um, so some of those, those pieces vary. Additionally, as we calculate out class size, uh, we know that a tech ed class is going to have a max class size of probably about 20, um, give or take a, a student or two, whereas maybe an English class or a math class can support a higher number of students in the classroom. Um, average class sizes ultimately are determined based upon the number of students who pick the class. Uh, so if we have a student that, or a class that, that has, you know, 30 students who want the class, we're not going to create two sections of 15. Instead, we're going to run one section of 30 as best as we can. And know that that class is then capped, and any student who comes in afterwards that wants that class maybe has to pick something else because the class is full. <coughs> um, <clears throat> so the, the data piece, which I really enjoyed. Bob did not enjoy so much. Um, <laughs> but this, this is... Uh, Put yourself in a room with yeah. Lisa Charlie. <laughs> if, if, you, if you could see my pivot tables, <laughs> yes, e-lookups yeah. and stuff in my, in my spreadsheets, like I'm, I'm very, very proud of those things. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't remember you having that much break. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't remember the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to kind of to go through here, and, and we'll, we'll start with art, for example. So in art, um, you can look at the number of course requests. So these are the number of raw student requests. Now, a student may choose two or three art classes in theory, um, but this is the number of classes that have been picked in the art department um, for which students are requesting. We then calculate that because those are semester-long classes into what we call FTE students. That, that include, I'm sorry, that includes, uh, like if, if some student requests that as their first choice and some other student requests that as their second choice, you These are just primary are choices. First choice. Correct. Okay, These are not important. alternates. Thanks. That. You may have said yeah. that and I missed it, but that's nope. important. Thank you. Thank, thanks for the clarification. <laughs> so FTE students, that's the number of students that would be essentially a year-long equivalent <coughs> um, because those are semesterized <coughs> classes. Um, really, those art teachers are not teaching 382 students all year long, they're really teaching, on average, 193 and a half students. So that's where that calculation comes in for. Um, okay. With that, you know, as we calculate out, out the, the courses that we want to have, um, knowing that we're going to have to combine some of those level two classes with a level one class to make sure that they, they are able to run, and that, that is standard practice. We've done that for years. Um, we're proposing that we have uh, 18 sections uh, of courses, so 18 different class sections. Um, which would be nine actual teaching assignments. Um, with that, we currently have two teachers. One of the teachers does share with Hales Corners Elementary, and so this would be a, a stable schedule for the art department from year to year. And you can see the progression from 18, 19, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20 21. So, so before we go on, this is sort of, I want to make sure that people understand um, to John's questions too, like this is the format that we used if each of those headers makes sense as far as FT students. The blue isn't filled in obviously because we think it's important to know with where sometimes we do have to adjust the number of sections um, for teaching assignments for whatever reason we grow or really drop. So that'll be filled in in the fall. That'll be how many we actually run. You shouldn't see lots of variances there for whatever reason, but in case there was for some reason. so. Just want to make sure that people can read because this is sort of the template that we use for middle school and for every department. If none of those make sense to you, just wanted to make sure that they were making sense. So you should see fairly flat numbers for, for most of the areas. Um, the other consideration when we are scheduling is there are some teachers who are dual certified. So for IT computer science, uh, that teacher is also certified as a math teacher and depending on the fluctuation of course enrollments in his in his department we have used him to fill in math sections here here and there but um, we, we try to obviously have have teachers and their schedules be as flat as possible so any questions on the numbers I don't I don't feel I need to on, on that chart no 
two, two at least uh, explanation on the, on the blue, if you did look at tech ed, uh, we did add another tech ed teacher. Um, so the number of section, tech, teaching sections actually went up um, over the summer. But yes, that is somewhat of an anomaly. <coughs> um, so it gets us to the point of the board policy in regards to classes under 18 or advanced classes under 12. Um, so with that, there are a few classes that we do have. And again, uh, looking at some of these courses, we know that some of them may fluctuate in, in course enrollment. Some of them are just going to be what they are. Um, so AP Studio Art as an advanced placement art class, that the students that are in there are in there. So that's not going to change. Um, our enterprise classes, you, you heard from them tonight. Again, those are students who then are oftentimes hand-selected to be in those classes. And, and really, it's a capstone class. Um, so we do know that those courses are going to increase in enrollment as more students finish out their second semester here and continue to gain those skills to be ready for those courses. Uh, jazz, jazz Ensemble, the 12 students in there, we, we typically run Jazz Ensemble with that. That's just one under where, where we'd expect it to be. Um, PE wellness as well. We know that as PE classes are fluctuated, that class will, will get up there. Uh, AP French at 10. That's pretty standard to where we've been. Um, the advanced acting. So this was a, a name change from a course. And uh, Tom has his musical theater ensemble class, which as, we, as he and I have looked at the actual names of students in those courses, um, we, we believe that some students maybe picked the wrong course, and so to have some conversations to, to move them into the right course so that they realize that one is going to be singing and dancing and the other is going to be acting so that they're not walking in day one and shocked to see that they have to sing and dance. Um, I don't know why I said that. The other two were added there when we were working <laughs> off of one initial plan, so yeah. we didn't take those off yeah. before. Uh, additionally, then, the... The combined courses, I spoke a little bit to the art courses, but then we also know that uh, historically French 1 and 2 have been combined, as well as our uh, engineering, manufacturing, and then all the metals, uh, ceramics, sculpture, and accounting classes. Um, so the 1 and 2 here is for years 1 and 2 versus semesters 1 and 2? So we, we, so each of... Yes, at the high school they're years. Okay. No? Sort of. So French one and two are, are year-long classes. Right. Okay. The engineering drawing one is a first semester course. Those are semester courses. But you have to complete engineering drawing one before you take engineering drawing two. Um, what you, we, meant you were just talking French, or were you talking because it's French? French, yeah. just okay. to get an okay. idea. Okay. So, so what we do with that is um, those level two classes are usually a continuation there of the skills that they've learned in those courses and can have some more personalized uh, and individualized projects for those students. Um, so in those par particular classes, the teachers are able to differentiate having level one students who've seen the material for the first time with level two students who are okay. continuing to work and advance through those, those things. So uh, combined, does that mean concurrent in the same classroom? Correct. OK. And there aren't numbers here for what reason? What, what do you mean? Like you have enrollment numbers under AP Studio Art next to that and Enterprise School Store, but you don't have enrollment numbers next to French 1 and 2. Because all, all of these enrollment numbers, when they're combined courses, would have over the 18 and under 32 enrollment. Oh, no, that's different. So it's just, it's just a, a four-year information of... No, that, that's good. I, just, it, I didn't get that from yeah. the table there. Yep. I think it was just to provide that background that if somebody said, oh, there's only, yeah, and I guess <coughs> I just a, couldn't tell that from, yep, the, yep, from yep, the table. So, so that helps. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on high school before I turn it over to middle school? So middle school is kind of trying to mimic as best as we can what Charlie's doing in the high school. So it is kind of starting to kind of follow some of those pieces. So um, again, we have our students, we've moved from um, before I was officially on staff, like my first night, we had registration night, it was April, we moved to, uh, or May, it was April last year, and now this year we registered in February and are finishing up um, our incoming sixth graders, like currently. So we've upped our timeline and looking to align it even more closely to the high schools for next year as well too, and kind of following their timeline with a lot of their events and stuff. And so um, again, our students pick their courses and they offer any of the electives or any additional
additional things. That is, there's a little difference for us as we went through, the, I think a board meeting or two ago, um, as our seventh and eighth graders pick all their electives, um, but our sixth graders are part of the wheel now, so they're really choosing just specifically which music class they wanna take. So they're selecting from band, choir, orchestra, or um, uh, music cultures, pop, the new general, like a general music class, music, cult music, music and culture. Um, but then the rest of our students have the option, depending on what courses they pick in seventh and eighth grade, depends on how many electives they take, which gets us a little goofy sometimes. So to have two math people helping you was, was beneficial. Um, but also, if you take a music class, that is a full year, like every other day class, where our other electives are semesters, A or B day courses, um, and, and except for uh, PE. So PE basically and music will run off each other in many cases, and then the other electives are semesters, but on an A or B day. So kind of like a quarter class, but <coughs> for a semester's timeline. Um, so th most of our courses as well, as you can kind of see, if you go down to our graphic there as well too, um, kind of following through. Some of our schedule has evolved in the last three years, so um, kind of doing our best to pull in some of the numbers, but at least it gives us an idea, especially like within um, student requests and teaching assignments. One of the biggest differences is with this year's is some of the elective classes. The students in sixth grade aren't choosing them. They're all being slotted into made, coding, art, um, Spanish, and French. So they're automatically getting that as part of that experience so that they're a little bit more informed in seventh and eighth grade because now our seventh and eighth grade courses are slowly starting to align to feed into what the high school is offering as either an intro class or like a level one class or whatever it might be called. So <laughs> where this year our sixth graders had some choice in some of our electives. So while some of the numbers in seventh and eighth grade may look down, the sixth grade numbers have upped that because every sixth grader is taking that course that in those in those elective areas. Um, and so that's what, like one of the factors, art's a good example of that, where art was at like a 4.75 staff this year, this year it's at a five and a half, which is a full staffing because every sixth grader is also being elect in, in put into that one. Um, you could also look, I know Dr. Olson shared earlier the pathways. Last year we offered health sciences for the first time, a health science one, um, which was taught by two of our teachers on an overload at the middle school. And then uh, Josh Prost from the high school came over and taught two sections of that. Um, we've almost doubled that course in numbers for, for kids that want to take that for next year. We've also offered a health science two course, which has about two sections worth of students being offered in that as well too. Um, but it really, if you as you go through ours, our courses, our electives are really filling up in that MADE, tech ed, and that computer science and coding, that, those couple pathways there are really large for us this year. I'd say our music numbers look to be kind of traditional, like they're kind of, there's a good pattern from the last couple of years. If you go back, we do not have all of our incoming sixth grader numbers, but they're mirroring what has happened in the last couple of years, at least that I can track and I see as well too. And our two courses that would be under um, numbers right now are orchestra in seventh and eighth, and that would also be a traditional number for the last couple of years as well. Can I just say as part of the registration process, uh, my son's in eighth grade, they actually talked to him about doing a summer school option to take care of the fire department. Yeah, the fire department. So instead of in the past where it would be us, you know, asking for it, they're actually prompting that for the students, which is great. Mm -hmm. It's easy. And our plan with that is once uh, those students have completed that, then we look at their alternate request to fill in for that. But that's, that's um, right. yeah, by by def we we that's one of those um, future forecasts that you you kind of have to do when you're building out the schedule is knowing that there are 26 students who've signed up for the summer school FIAD class. That that means there are potentially 26 students who would not then be in a FIAD that's nine class. Right. That's great. Um, so, uh, Bob, uh, your standalone courses, <coughs> minimum, under minimum course requests, so orchestra seventh grade, orchestra eighth grade, uh, maybe I don't understand the structure uh, with that program quite yet, but uh, my experience with band and orchestra and that kind of stuff, um, even, well, if I go back enough years to where I was in it, uh, often has um, students from different you know, musicians from different uh, ages and skill levels uh, combined and um, that is it's one place where like a maximum uh, number
number of students of like 30 doesn't necessarily apply when you have a, a conductor and if we were so fortunate to have 120 students interested or something, you know, that's acceptable numbers uh, in many cases. So uh, cut to the chase, why aren't uh, orchestras 7th and 8th grade combined? Um, they have not traditionally been combined for the numbers there. Um, th I think that maybe a discussion worth having at some point. And I would say for the first time, so when Bob talked <coughs> about the heavy lifting we've been doing with the schedule, um, seventh and eighth grade now are back on the same schedule. So that wasn't a possibility up until like 2021. And so besides getting aligned with the high school, one of the things that we're looking at is that some of the classes will have seventh and eighth graders in the same elective that has never been ha that never happened yeah. in this middle school for tradition. Rather than, oh, I took a year of art and this is my first year, you should have seventh and eighth graders together. So it might be something that we look like look at in the future. Because it seems like large musical groups are are made for multiple ages, multiple skill levels, you know, first chair, first section on down to, you know, third section, fourth. And, and um, um, but I, I, I mean, you know, I wouldn't want to propose that if I thought that it would, uh, you know, if statistics show or experience, uh, which is even better than statistics show, show that uh, it could be detrimental to the, to the growth of the, you know, young musicians, then I think that'd be a bad idea. But it, but it might actually be an improvement because of uh, uh, larger numbers playing the music. You know, I don't know. Just there, there are 32 students total between yeah. seventh and eighth grade. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was partly putting both these on there. That you know, the seventh grade, if that's your your <coughs> more intermediate group, may be under that 17 even further, um, and that eighth grade group. Still may be under that 17, but maybe above it. Um, hard, it's hard to say at this at this exact moment what, would, how I, that would shake out. I just think that unless it's, regardless of the numbers, I would just think that unless it's detrimental to their individual development, yeah. that mm -hmm. that might be something that could easily be combined and, and easier to deal with than, than French 1 and French 2 combined or something, you know what I mean, which is really. As, as Dr. Olson talked about, we, one of the things, we, our schedule is, like, is aligned for us to Finally. start to try to right. consider that moving forward, mm -hmm. even in other areas. So um, if a student hasn't taken MADE before, and they take MADE 1, they're not going to an 8th grader, they may be mixed with other kids. So they, eventually, some of the other courses, I think, are lending themselves a little more naturally to that happening, but that would definitely be something we can talk about. So there could be Orchestra 1 and Orchestra 2 then, or something, mm -hmm. as opposed to Orchestra 7th grade and Orchestra 8th grade. And we've had, we've had like, those discussions, but we haven't had a um, structure that has allowed that. Yeah, I understand. Sure. But, but like I said, different ages and skill levels yep. are kind of the standard in it. Well, I don't know. Lynn's back there. She did this for years, but um, I would think it's standard. In, uh, just a thought. I didn't know if that had been looked at or not. Thanks. So I guess the courses that you see for low enrollment may change between now and the 30th. Obviously, you'll see it in the packet before there because counselors are still working on some of the things that was talked about. So. Some of them may not show up on there, but these were the initial numbers and per board policy. That's why we're bringing them, bringing them forward. Thank you. Thank you. You're Thanks a lot. Should we clap for you too? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now we'll move on to six action items. A is the addition of special education coaches. I'll take a motion to approve. So moved. And second? Second. Okay, and now discussion. <laughs> no. Um, so um, in the middle of the year, we had an opportunity to add a position at the middle school and we have sort of mimicked the structure of the coaches without officially having it be a leadership role. So our new hire there has been able to work with students directly on um, specially designed instruction related to reading as well as work with special education teachers and also um, the special ed teachers on their co-teaching model. So we've had a lot of success in not only some growth in their <coughs> academic scores, but also a reduction in time spent out of class in the office due to behavior. So um, when looking at our testing model that we currently use, we took that as an opportunity to sort of look at how we could reallocate 
money and positions in order to duplicate this at our other buildings. So that's really what the proposal is all about. Anybody any questions? Can, can you sp spell out the, the, uh, the, you said reallocate money and positions? So um, as they described in there, we have traditionally had a position um, with a diagnostician mm -hmm. who did all of the testing for our initial evaluations. Um, we would use the dollars from that position and that would basically give us one coaching spot. We already have a, a position in place at the middle school. Um, we have a position that we were unable to fill last year at the high school where we have that allocation of dollars. So that gives us position number three and then the fourth position would be a new dollars. Yeah, as noted below, spe special education is really an interesting funding piece in which there, there are some federal guidelines that, that you know, say you have to be spending X amount of dollars per year. We've actually been seeing, uh, um, due to a number of different bizarre factors, we've actually seen our, our um, it's called maintenance of effort, how much you've shown to be spending from year to year. It has been decreasing, but it's been because of, of health insurance costs that fluctuate from year to year. So it's a really bizarre thing that because we're self-funded, as our health benefits go down and we report our expenditures, it looks like we're not always spending as much money as we have in the past on special education <coughs> students, even though it's just the health benefits that are being, lo that are lower or higher on any given year. So it's an interesting um, piece here. So we've seen our, our actual fund 10 costs um, decrease a little over the past year, year and a half, due to some of those factors that Jackie said, either a loss through attrition and staff or because of our health insurance running very well, um, that we have the capability to kind of pick on, to, to pick up some of these positions and have it still fit well within our, within our budget. Anybody else? So the, I guess the work that's been done by the other educators in this role has kind of helped close that gap now that we... Slowly, I mean, we're only, yeah. you know, about a quarter into yeah. some of that work, but he does um, have some data to show growth um, and direct data with um, the time out of class, which has been huge for a number of kids um, at the middle school. And yeah, I mean, definitely we, our goal would be that if we provide more specific instruction around reading and math, that we can help our special ed staff provide that, that um, we will close up. So having this be just one board meeting, obviously we, we, with these positions now being identified, the sooner we can get out and post for positions early enough in the, in now the hiring quote unquote season, um, you know, the, the, the better applicant pool we, we hope to get, especially looking at three positions, three additional positions. Um, that, that's why this is being brought as a one versus, um, versus a two, two meeting. That answers my next question. Thanks. Yeah. And did anybody at any point sign up or show interest in speaking on this? Yeah. I mean, we've got two people here, but since it's a, just a mm -hmm. once and done meeting, oh, no. this is yeah, nobody has signed on. up. Okay, anybody else? Thanks, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> All in favor? Oh, yeah. Aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Okay, we already did reports, so on eight items for future consideration. Okay. On to nine announcements. Yeah, just like. Boys basketball and girls basketball in tremendous seasons. Uh, some tough playoff losses, but I'm sure next year we'll go even further in the playoffs. And then uh, all the students that were in NHS and got inducted um, oh, yeah. on Thursday, Wednesday, Wednesday. Um, it was a really good ceremony, and thank our dean of students. She gave an excellent speech. So good Thanks. stuff. It was the fifth, whatever day that was. Thursday. Yeah, it was good. Good ceremony. Disregard show is still out. Yeah, yeah, that looks well. awesome. <laughs> um, a lot of talent. So, solo ensemble was hosted here on Saturday. 
and I was here helping out, and I had an interesting kind um, talk with one of our music teachers. So you saw the um, Katie Sider from the middle school band sent out to us the list of how the middle school students did. You notice there's probably about 20 students who got a one. Mm -hmm. That would make eight more students than Greendale had total submitted into solo ensemble Ooh. for those who like to compare music programs. <clears throat> Can you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> well, just, just to make sure they caught it. <laughs> so just saying that our, our students did no, very well. Uh, we, yes. <laughs> this was all aside numbers, but yes. And one of those was going to state, right? Uh, not from middle school, but we've had several go to state. Like the two we saw here, the two performances here, <laughs> that, they both made it to state. Well, I I didn't see any was on asterisk at the very right top. There may be one. Oh, there was one. I, did, I missed the asterisk. I looked quickly. Right top of the list. But, so, yeah, if they got an asterisk, they're going. I think there may be one, yeah. Okay. I, I went back looking and I missed that, so I'm, I apologize for that one. Dynamite. We had quite a few students oh. as part of the All Star, the middle school All Star band down at UWM as well. Yes. And then some of the UA performances as well. So, those are all addition based. So, it was. Great. Yeah. There is one that's going to state. There is. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else announcements? Um, just a reminder: on March 30th, uh, we're going to be having a working session with Joe. Um, he's going to be sending out a survey ahead of time uh, that hopefully we can all complete, and that'll help guide the, uh, the working session. The meeting, our board meeting that night will start at 6, and then we'll go right from the board meeting into the working <coughs> session. So look for that email from Joe probably later this week. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Then I'll move on to 10. Motion to adjourn a closed session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.85. One, B and C to discuss A, personnel termination, and B, personnel staffing. So moved. And second? Second. Roll call vote, Quinn. Aye. Stephen? Aye. Jonathan? Aye. Kevin? Aye. John? Aye. Karen? Aye. Okay. Thank you all. Have a great evening.